Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Mike Crane. I have the, uh, I'm director of the World Trade Center Clinical Center here at Mount Sinai. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, coordinating duties with our deputy, uh, Dr. Laura Crowley. Uh, and um, um, we may make mean faces at the, some of the speakers, but we're really nice when you get to know us. Uh, nothing to worry about. So um, just to, uh, to open the, sh the, uh, the morning, I want to introduce uh, our chairman of environmental medicine and public health, uh, Dr. Robert Wright. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, welcome to the WTC HP conference. Uh, we at Mount Sinai are honored to be the site of the largest WTC Clinical Center of Excellence, as well as the Responders Data Center. Uh, we are particularly proud to be hosting this event, which marks the beginning of 75 more years of healthcare and support for 9-11 responders and survivors. We hope that today will mark the dawn of a new era for the WTC health program, one in which the program will become even better at treating and preventing illness. We hope that the findings of the research you're here about today will continue to assist not only the WTC responders, but also workers around the world who seek to blunt the impacts of disasters and terrorist attacks, and to help us as healthcare workers to better understand the long-term implications of how these events cause diseases that may not be evident for years. We at Mount Sinai are also grateful to all of you who worked so hard to reauthorize this important program because it gives us the opportunity to serve and treat those who are afflicted. Today's discussions presage a future that is full of hope, but will also illustrate the hard work that is ahead of us. So speaking from Mount Sinai, I congratulate you and wish you all and the WTC Health Program every success both today and tomorrow. Please enjoy the program. Uh, thanks so much, Bob. Um, is Reverend Hayes here, Father Hayes? Okay. So. Um, we were going to have an invocation, but the, the Reverend was, has another pastoral duty to attend to. Uh, and as is sadly typical, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to open the meeting now uh, by asking you to join me in a moment of silence commemorating those we have lost. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and now, before I uh, start the introduction of our keynote speaker, I just want to go over a couple of details. As you can see from the agenda, our speakers will be talking 15 to 20 minutes, hopefully to allow brief questions and, af uh, and answers afterwards. Uh, we will pull out time cards when you have five and two minutes left. And uh, at the end of that time, I personally will charge the stage and take you down. Um, but don't worry. Um, we have a lunch on the schedule. Uh, th there are press here uh, who may want to talk with you. We have a little room outside the uh, d uh, door, the green room. It has a lovely uh, table uh, for you to sit around. And also it doubles as an autopsy table if things really get serious. Um, uh, the restrooms are to the left. The coffee was across the hall. Um, and now I'm going to say something that I don't even know what it means. We are being uh, live webcast and Twittered. I, I think that's great, whatever it is. My, my children know, but I don't. Uh, so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Jim Milius, the chairman of our steering committee, to bring on our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you that the caffeine has not kicked in yet, I am not giving the invocation. This is not the Reverend Hayes, so, <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> uh, instead, I get the, uh, the honor of introducing uh, uh, Dr. John Howard, who will be giving a, our keynote today. Um, I'm going to skip the usual uh, uh, NIOSH uh, bio introduction uh, for him. Uh, at, at his request, uh, though I am curious about the part about you know 
growing up in the wooden shack on the beach in San Diego and, you know, reading by the uh, driftwood fire. I don't know. It was something. I'll have to ask you about that later. But uh, uh, John is someone that uh, uh, actually doesn't come up here, at least on, on World Trade Center events that, that often. And uh, uh, we don't get a chance to thank him for all his efforts. But uh, we wouldn't be here today if John had not been uh, as sort of, I believe, as the longest serving NIOSH director. Uh, as administrator of this program from the beginning, but e even prior to the beginning of the official uh, Zadroga legislative uh, program and authorization, John was uh, key in keeping this program going, keeping the, the, the funding going, and we had some pretty rough times uh, with uh, you know, limited funding and people trying to take away funding. I think at one point a high-ranking official came and told us that he was going to uh, give us some money for treatment, but we had to send out, immediately send out letters telling people that the money wouldn't last very long and you better find another source of, of funding and, you know, nice, nice things like that. So and John throughout has, has, you know, provided, I think, the, the support to keeping the program going and then the support for getting the legislation passed, as well as the credibility in how the program was being managed and run. And it's been a monumental task for we're pulling together initially with some very limited staff, now a little better staffing and a little bit more help, but, but what's become a very complicated and a you know, very large program. And uh, we owe John a great deal of thanks for all of his efforts for uh, doing that over the years and for staying with us and for really uh, making sure that the, the, the people that are served by this program, which is what the program's about, um, are get the kind of medical services that they uh, deserve and uh, now will have those medical services for uh, throughout their lifetime. So that, that's uh, very important and, and we really want to thank John for all of his efforts for doing that. So let me introduce John, Administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program. Thank you, Jim. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to participate in this conference marking 15 years since uh, 19 terrorists using four jetliners as guided missiles uh, killed nearly 3,000 people, injured many thousands more, and enveloped the country in fear on September 11, 2001. On the day that the World Trade Center towers fell, the Federal Aviation Administration had a watch list of 12 people. The CIA had been tracking two of the terrorists around the world, but failed to inform the FBI. In this uh, post-September 11th era that we're now in, the phrase connecting the dots was born. Air safety has been transformed. The Air Marshals program, which had withered, has been reconstituted. The first of now almost 50,000 airport screeners were hired. The number of Border Patrol agents has been doubled. And a September 11th Victims Compensation Fund was conceived and passed by Congress in 10 days to compensate loved ones of those who had died in the attacks and those injuries people had sustained within 96 hours of the attacks. Even while the disaster area still burned, an army of rescue recovery and cleanup workers, professional and volunteer, descended on the sites in New York and Virginia and Pennsylvania or engaged in a supportive role to do what they could. Many disaster business Owners lost the source of their livelihood. Residential spaces were contaminated by dust and debris from the disaster, and many had to leave their homes, schools, or workplaces. Often residents, including children, became cleanup and recovery workers themselves, trying to decontaminate their living spaces. Soon, it was widely apparent that those, to those who were caring for the many thousands of responders and survivors, 
that their physical and mental health had been adversely affected by the disaster. Even in the earliest 9-11 health research studies conducted during the active phase of the cleanup and recovery, many acute adverse health effects were noted. In August of 2002, I traveled to New York City, having been on the job at NIOSH for about two weeks, to New York City to participate in a news conference announcing the first grant of federal government funds to screen and monitor responders' health. Early clinical reports arising from the grant program firmly established that the adverse health effects in responders and survivors were real. And while monitoring was an important first step, the absence of treatment was a serious weakness, which I personally heard about many times. In 2006, Congress funded treatment of responders and subsequently community members, residents, local workers, and passers-by in 2008. Through all the changes in the grant program, though, the ups and the downs of yearly federal budgeting, 9-11 practitioners and scientists at the various funded centers of excellence and at the World Trade Center Health Registry provided valuable research findings that told the story of an exposed population whose health was adversely affected by September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Without those early and scientifically beneficial research efforts by many in this room today, the grant program would have petered out. It would have ended, and along with that, any future benefit that the health services for those affected would have disappeared also. But instead, all of the scientific endeavors and the complex array of advocacy that occurred now ensures that 9-11 responders and survivors can receive the health care they need for a lifetime. So on behalf of the 75,000 members of the World Trade Center Health Program, thank you all for the efforts that you have done to capture the population health effects from 9-11 in scientific research publications. The evidence provided by early research findings published during the nine years of the grant program helped create the World Trade Center Health Program, a limited federal health entitlement. The James Adroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act of 2010 provides significant funding for the continuation of the research efforts begun in 2001. During the first five years of the World Trade Center Health Program, 42 scientific projects worth nearly $90 million were awarded to scientists from the World Trade Center Centers of Excellence, from the World Trade Center Health Registry, and from various universities. It is important to note, I think, five things about the initial research portfolio under the statutory version of the World Trade Center Health Program. First, there is a $15 million annual funding that is specifically directed to scientific research and is a separate budget from the clinical services provided by the health program. Second, the areas of research are really much broader in the statutory program than during the grant program. Research areas encompass both physical and mental health disorders in both adults and children over their entire lifetime. Third, the development of the research agenda for the current program is a collaborative and transparent process in which, at the conception stage, input from the responder and survivor steering committees, from scientific and technical advisory committee to the program, 
from research grantee conferences, from medical forum meetings with the Centers of Excellence, from outreach and education, and from members themselves through the statutory process for filing a petition to add another health condition to the list of World Trade Center related health conditions. And since its inception, the program has added 24 types of malignant neoplasms, new onset chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and the medical sequelae related to acute traumatic injury sustained during the disaster. Fourth, research results do nobody any good if they're not disseminated to practitioners and to the members. The program's strategic research to care model deserves, I think, all of our consideration. It emphasizes a community of practice engaging members and stakeholders, clinicians, researchers throughout the United States for the purpose of translating the new knowledge that we get from researchers into practice to optimize the health outcome of the members. Fifth, the research agenda continues to expand. Ideas include health services research on value-based care models for 9-11 chronic diseases, long-term impacts on workability, psychological resilience for disaster responders, the complex interplay of the aging process and 9-11 health conditions, and ways to ensure the retention and the cohesion of the population of responders and survivors through time and geography. Regardless of the scientific topic, all World Trade Center health program research must be aimed at discovering better ways to provide the highest quality of care for the health program members. Given the backdrop of the changing American health care system, World Trade Center health program research would be remiss in not assessing how the program can best transition between varying levels of service acuity defined by the trajectory of 9-11 chronic illnesses. Excellence in service delivery should also include attention to novel case management and care quality models that assist members to achieve optimum health, whether they are an outpatient, an inpatient, or are receiving post-acute care. The future of the World Trade Center Health Program research, I think, is very promising for two reasons. One, the existence of continued protected funding. And two, a cadre of outstanding researchers with the passionate dedication to improving the health of 9-11 responders and survivors. With such promise, though, comes accountability. Evaluating how well the World Trade Center Health Program is doing in meeting its statutory research mandate, in meeting the needs of members for quality care, and in generating new ways to deliver the program's health services in the most cost-effective way it can, it's vitally important to ensuring a viable future for the 9-11 research program. In the first 15 years after the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks in New York and Arlington, Virginia and Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the early appropriations only program and now the World Trade Center health program fully authorized by federal law until 2090, have each produced much new knowledge to aid those whose health was affected by September 11, 2001 itself, and in the subsequent months and years since, and that will follow. So I end by thanking all of the researchers in this room for their contribution to promoting the health of 9-11 members and for being pivotal in ensuring that we are here today, 15 years later, looking forward to the future of 2090.
thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Um, what we'll have now is uh, a review of the clinical programs. Um, each of the um, clinical directors will give a short uh, discussion, and then we'll uh, return to uh, more lengthy uh, discussions. Uh, so our program leaders uh, who will be discussing today are Dr. Dave Prezant of the Fire Department Program, Dr. Joan Reibman, Survivors, and Dr. Laura Crowley for the consortium. And I guess we're starting with Dave. Thank you. There we go. Good. <clears throat> so uh, at the New York City Fire Department, we have approximately, in any given year, 11,500 firefighters and fire officers, approximately 3,500 EMS workers. And on 9-11, they responded. In addition to that, there were recent and past retirees who volunteered and came to 9-11 on that day and mostly on subsequent days to help out with the effort. And this resulted in exposures to nearly 16,000 New York City firefighters and EMS members. And I thought it would be uh, important to show you just briefly uh, a little bit about who those people are. Uh, right now, uh, through this DROGA-funded World Trade Center Health Program, we have 15,706 members who have actually enrolled. Uh, 15,200 have had at least one monitoring exam since 2001, which really is the denominator that defines their participation in our program, which means that 97% of the people that are enrolled and that were exposed have actually participated at least once to give us a baseline. What we're most proud of is the fact that we've had phenomenal retention. And if you look at people who've had at least seven monitoring exams, and I could give you at least 12 monitoring exams with very similar numbers, 80% have had numerous medical monitoring exams. And 84% have had a recent monitoring exam within the last 24 months. And that is without spending a single taxpayer dollar on advertisement or on identifying these people. Every dollar we've even received has gone to healthcare uh, and to research. The mean age on 9-11 was 44, so 16 years later, uh, the mean age is 60. Uh, English is our primary language, which gives us a uh, advantage in terms of delivering questionnaires to our members. Uh, they have all had to pass a civil service exam to become either a firefighter or an EMS worker. So their literacy level uh, is a little bit higher and allows us an advantage in, in, in obtaining information a little bit more easily. Uh, our firefighters are almost all male. 99% uh, uh, and uh, at this time almost all uh, Caucasian. Uh, EMS is more diverse, 78% uh, uh, male in terms of the people who are enrolled in our program and 50% uh, uh, Caucasian. Uh, the initial arrival time at the World Trade Center Ground Zero uh, really uh, has been a way to categorize our workforce and and actually, while it's probably uh, the thing that uh, we get uh, the least uh, credit for, uh, it, it actually was really the determining factor in figuring out exposure response gradients. So typically after an environmental or occupational uh, disaster, you think about the number of hours that people are exposed, the number of days, the number of weeks, the number of months, the number of years. Uh, and that works in the workplace because the exposure is typically constant as long as they don't change their job or there's some new protective uh, intervention. But here, uh, modeling the exposure was incredibly complex and remains incredibly complex because the exposure varied uh, tremendously after the first morning when the dust was so thick that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, and then over the next three days until the rains occurred, uh, and then thereafter diminishing, but for individual workers, individual volunteers, uh, et cetera, 
uh, there was spikes of extreme exposure if they were doing digging or recovery. So very hard to, to model this unless uh, people wore personal uh, monitors, which for the most part they did not. Uh, we took uh, a simplistic uh, approach to this, uh, informed by the fact uh, that many of us were actually down there uh, during the collapse and on subsequent days, and realized that, uh, at least for our workforce, the massive acute exposure uh, could serve as a surrogate uh, the time, the initial time arrival there would be a good surrogate for exposure. And it's wound up, uh, thankfully, uh, that every one of our studies has shown uh, an exposure response gradient based on initial arrival time. So with that said, 15% of our workforce was there either during the collapse or during the morning of the collapse. 343 died that day, but nearly 2,300 uh, survived uh, and had that type of massive exposure. Over the next afternoon, another 44% of our workforce was there, and over the next day, another nearly 20%. So if you add all of that up, you wind up with somewhere between 65 and 70% of our workforce having been there first arrival time uh, during the first uh, 24 to 48 hours, which is uh, an amazing response. Right? that way over 10,000 people uh, were able to arrive that quickly uh, to help New York. Unfortunately, uh, early respirator use was not something that we can be incredibly proud of. At the same time, it's understandable. Uh, firefighters had the best respirator on the planet Earth, the self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, but it only lasts about 15 minutes. During a regular fire, we take them out and we put in new workers with a new a respirator, but while we were under attack, we could not do that. Um, and there was also self-responders, uh, as I said, some of the retirees, many of the active firefighters who were not on duty, uh, and they did not have a self-contained breathing apparatus. So if you look here, uh, you can see uh, that none, which is the uh, first bar at each of the time intervals uh, in blue, uh, represents uh, over 50% of the workers who were there on the first day. Uh, but even more telling is if you uh, summate all of the bars that are not yellow. The yellow bar represents a respirator. Everything else represents either none or something that really isn't acceptable. And when you do look at it that way, you can see that on day one, 90% of the workforce did not have adequate respiratory protection. And that is the basis for this huge exposure and was the basis for us starting our first monitoring exam using FEMA dollars and New York City dollars during the first week of October 2001. The New York City Fire Department is part of what I believe to be the greatest labor management health initiative ever came together uh, and started this uh, and had an immense uh, outpouring of support. And we designed this program similar to the way the entire program is designed, thinking that monitoring would help us and keying in on mental health, respiratory, and late emerging diseases. Uh, and we're uh, lucky that over time, we've developed a model where we have a clinical center of excellence uh, with the help of NIOSH supporting us and, and allowing us to concentrate our thoughts in this way uh, a clinical center of excellence and a data center that captures all this data from numerous sources so that we can present this information to you, but most importantly to every patient we see. Because nearly every patient we see asks us two questions. Number one, how am I doing? Obviously. But number two, how are my buddies doing? And this allows us to answer that question. So you can see here we're getting a wealth of data from the clinical center, but also from our pharmacy program, from claims processing, from patient coordination services, from tumor registries, all centers into one data center that is shared. So that our thought process has always been to provide information at both, to provide and capture information, both at the micro level and at the macro level. At the micro level, we're determining or helping NIOSH to determine as the program evolved, eligibility, 
we're monitoring, we're treating, we're doing diagnostic testing, all leading to allowing NIOSH to certify the various different illnesses, we're providing medications, and we're constantly thinking about quality assurance and quality improvement. And that's at the individual practitioner to clinician to patient level. But at the same time, the information that we capture allows us to think about this at the macro level, at the cohort level, where we think about these things in a broader basis. But bringing this information, that's why this bi-directional arrow exists here at the top, somewhere, <laughs> bringing this information back to the clinician and the patient. We've done numerous monitoring exams. Just this last year, we've done nearly 10,500 monitoring exams. And you can see that every year, especially in the last uh, years of the Zadroga Act funding, that we've done nearly 10,000 monitoring exams per year, over 10,000 per year. This translates into treatment, all right? Monitoring identifies problems, and problems need to be treated. And as Dr. Howard said, one of the real problems with the program was a lack of funding for treatment. We were treating early on using city dollars, using philanthropic dollars, using Project Liberty mental health dollars. But once we received dollars from the federal government through NIOSH, uh, things really wound up uh, being an effective program. Uh, and you can see here the number of patients that have been seen annually uh, in World Trade Center treatment uh, for physical health. I'll show you mental health in a moment. And this has resulted in uh, certifications so that we can provide care to specific issues and also so that NIOSH and uh, us can track the uh, number of people that have uh, specific problems. So that we have over 5,000 with upper airway diagnoses, for the most part chronic rhinosinusitis, some with vocal cord problems. We have over 5,400 with lower airway disease, predominantly obstructive airway disease, asthma, chronic bronchitis, to a lesser extent, far lesser extent, COPD, emphysema. We also have some interstitial lung disease. Sarcoidosis is the largest one, uh, affecting nearly 100 of our people, uh, and uh, uh, a small number of uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis uh, patients. We have 5,300 people with gastrointestinal issues. For the most part, this is GERD, Barrett's, uh, ulcers, uh, things of that sort. And one of the things just got out of order, so I'm just going to jump to this one. And uh, over time, uh, as will be talked about in subsequent uh, talks, through research efforts, uh, we were able to demonstrate to NIOSH uh, that cancers, we and the other programs together acting collaboratively, were able to demonstrate that cancer uh, should be added as a World Trade Center covered uh, program. And to date, we have 16. 147 people who have been certified with uh, at least one cancer. Uh, and the cancers of note, uh, and I'll be talking about this more later, uh, thyroid, prostate, hematologic malignancies, colon cancer, uh, are increased in our group. Uh, and then there are some other cancers that are uh, important as well. Uh, in terms of mental health issues, uh, we treat over 1,700 people per year in terms of mental health. And, uh, and this has resulted in certification of uh, numerous people. Uh, our most numerous, of course, is post-traumatic stress disorder with about 1,700 people certified. Uh, but depression uh, is now actually our most uh, common problem and we have about 1,500 people who have been certified for that. Here is a complicated slide, but I just want you to look at the top uh, line. The top line shows that over time, uh, we've been certifying individual patients with multiple conditions. So this demonstrates the complexity uh, of the disease process, of the treatment process. These patients do not have one disease they typically have multiple diseases. So you can see here that by 2015, uh, we have uh, a large number of treatment visits that are based on multiple certifications, the top line being four or more certifications. Our medication costs uh, are, are huge. Uh, in large part, we've moved to, uh, along with, with NIOSH's help, 
we've moved to a generic uh, primary uh, program, but many of the key medications that we use to treat uh, obstructive airways disease and cancer uh, are still brand name meds, and therefore you can see large number of claims, you can see a large number of dollars on the far right-hand side, uh, but uh, the prescription program uh, accounts for at least half of the dollars that we spend uh, in terms of uh, monitoring and treatment. And I'm going to conclude with this slide because this is the most important slide uh, that we have uh, at FDNY. And this slide is the members themselves saying, has this program been of benefit to them in the most important way? Do they feel that their health has improved with the treatment that we've provided? And when we ask that question, you can see that 53% of the members feel that they've had an improvement in their health, right? and that 40% have felt that at least their health has not deteriorated, despite some pretty complex diseases. And I think that is the single data point that we can be most proud of. And I thank you for your attention. So, uh, again, as part of the Zadroga Act and the NIOSH program, we do uh, a variety of things, all right? First off, uh, early on, starting in 2001, we were doing uh, chest X-rays and pulmonary function tests. Uh, as the evidence uh, was provided through the National Cancer Institute in heavy smokers throughout America, uh, we were able to add low-dose chest CT screening as part of our monitoring program. Uh, so to those people who were exposed and are heavy smokers, uh, we also provide low-dose chest CT screening annually. Uh, and that is the most effective screening program as been shown in the literature for the early diagnosis of lung cancer. Yes. Let me repeat that so that everyone else can hear it. The, the question was, uh, the NIOSH program uh, uses the USP blah, 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 uh, task force recommendations for uh, screening for cancers, uh, and we do follow that. So that would be uh, that low-dose chest CT screening annually should be provided to people with a 30-pack or greater year smoking history, uh, and typically this is above the age of 55, and if they are an ex-smoker, they should have uh, stopped smoking less than 15 years ago. And that is what we, what we do. As, uh, but your question was, uh, how have we tried to implement the National Cancer uh, Network, NCCN uh, guidelines? The problem with the NCCN guidelines is they don't provide specificity. So while they say that additional cancer risk additional lung cancer risk is related to abnormal lung function and related to occupational or environmental exposure, they don't allow you to quantify this. So if they had said something like increased lung cancer occurs with a FEV1 lung function of less than 45% of predicted and with a occupational exposure to the World Trade Center of arriving during the first day or more than 30 days there, uh, that would have provided us with some quantitative guidelines that we might have considered implementing. Right now, we're sort of trying to find out from our own studies what would be thresholds that we could uh, suggest to NIOSH to broaden this coverage. And those studies are ongoing. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I usually follow all the responders and firefighters, so I'm sort of a little bit uh, discombobulated here to be presenting right after David. It's always difficult to follow him anyway. Uh, I'm uh, Joan Reibman, and I am, uh, just to clarify for those of you, New York University is the academic center, uh, and uh, the, our program is really out of health and hospitals. 
uh, and uh, we have several sites, but I'm uh, part of Bellevue. So let me start by saying I, I always feel that I have to explain uh, the exposures that we're talking about in the community population compared to the responder and um, firefighter population so that you understand the terminology that we're using and the difficulties in exposure modeling, just like David said, for the firefighters, which are even more complex uh, in the community population. So when we're talking about the community population, we're really talking about a potential exposure to approximately 60,000 individuals who live below Canal Street on 9-11, 300,000 individuals who are working, um, including tower evacuees on 9-11. We think approximately 15,000 students and some numbers of individuals who are passing by as commuters or tourists in this very busy hub at that time. So potential for enormous exposure to a very disparate community. When we think about, at this point, when we start to think about exposures for this community, we, we have simplified, uh, just because of necessity, uh, the type of exposures we think about. And those include acute exposures, which could have been from the debris, um, let me just fix this, from the debris, uh, at, from the collapsing buildings on 9-11, or massive inhalation of the dust from the dust clouds from the collapsing buildings and uh, this is an area here. Uh, these are individuals who, uh, this is a now very famous picture from people who were caught in the dust cloud on 9-11, uh, making their way out. Trauma injuries and burns suffered during escape from the towers and the surrounding buildings. Many individuals were trampled. Many people fell. Uh, individuals also had burns. And then also, uh, as shown in the lower picture, exposure and inhalation of dust on 9-11 after the dust cloud dissipation as individuals were um, trying to escape from their apartments or their workplaces. So just on 9-11 itself, there's quite a varied potential for a, a whole slew of different types of exposures. We then understand that many of these individuals also had potential for chronic exposures. Those include exposures to the local workers who returned on 9-17 amid resuspended dust both outdoors and inside the workplaces, and I show you a picture of the streets uh, covered in resuspended dust. They included uh, exposure as residents uh, who returned, whoops, sorry, uh, to their homes, uh, most of which had not been cleaned, either to come and clean their homes, uh, some individuals had to shovel out the dust, uh, or to come and get their uh, belongings while they were um, evacuated from their homes. It includes exposure of a population that is actually shared between the programs of cleanup workers who are exposed to the outdoors and indoor dust in the homes and commercial buildings. And then for many individuals who worked or lived down there, exposure to the fumes from the fires that burned through uh, December 2001. So again, a very complicated way to model exposures. And for most of us, we haven't actually gotten our hands around it, but have tried to simplify it just for initial uh, evaluation. In addition, for the community population, there are a variety of exposures that we consider mental health exposures. And that includes, for many, fear of one's death, escaping the collapsing buildings, being overwhelmed by the dust cloud, individuals not knowing what was happening, feeling the end of the world had come. Many uh, were caught in tunnels and had no way of communicating. Many either lost or feared for loss of their loved ones or colleagues. Many witnessed death or dismemberment. Uh, many were exposed to the extended rescue and recovery efforts uh, as they returned to their work or homes. Uh, there was continued oral, olfactory, and visual stimuli for months after the event. Many were displaced from their homes and their workplaces. Uh, something we rarely talk about, but the guilt of potential endangerment of others. Should I bring my children back? Should I not? Uh, very, very important for many individuals. And also for very many, loss of work and income. So again, a very complex exposure to mental health uh, risks uh, that are very complicated to understand. 
So the World Trade Center Environmental Health Program, which is the survivor program, the program for community members, uh, had a different history than you'll hear for the FDNY or for the responder programs, in part because it had such a disparate population uh, with potential to uh, uh, join the program. We started really first as a treatment program in Bellevue Hospital, an ad hoc treatment program, uh, with the community coming and bringing patients into a asthma program that uh, was not set up, really, to deal with this type of population. We then were very lucky to obtain uh, uh, philanthropic funding in 2005 uh, for treatment. So again, I'm focusing on the concept of treatment in this program. We uh, were uh, given funding in 2006 from the city of New York, and in 2008, uh, we obtained federal funding from CDC NIOSH, our first federal funding. And then, uh, as you all know, in 2010, uh, we were included on, in the James Droga Act uh, under NIOSH, and that's the program that we are to date. So we have a different history, which, set, which sort of gives us a different background. And what it, what it means is that we have never been a general screening program. Uh, we are a treatment program, so in order to enter into our program always, one had to have exposure of a variety of sorts, and one had to have what we considered World Trade Center-related symptoms, a concept that has evolved over the years. We are a monitoring program for those who are enrolled, but not a screening program for the asymptomatic. We're also, under the Zadroga Act, an insurance-first program, so we... Uh, have to bill insurance first and then cover with World Trade Center funds. We cu currently exist at three sites, Bellevue Hospital, Gouverneur, and Elmhurst. And we have a pediatric program only at one of those sites, which is uh, Bellevue Hospital. To date, 10,000 individuals have been enrolled into the World Trade Center health program. Uh, we haven't seen all of those individuals, and the data that I'm going to present to you is based on about 7,000 individuals. So we differ from the responder program immensely, and I just want to highlight some of those differences because these are important as we start to think about disease processes. First of all, our program is 50% women, so very, very different than uh, firefighters and very different than the responders. Second of all, we're an older program, so the median age at initial visit was 52, older than the FDNY. But we have a huge spread with individuals who, in fact, were born on, in 2001 uh, and individuals who were more than 60 years old, in fact, 70, 80 years old. I don't think we had any 90-year-old people uh, who were uh, in our initial visit. So that means that we have to think about illnesses a little bit differently uh, as well, and we have to consider illnesses across all age groups. We have a very diverse race ethnicity. So in our group, about 30% self-report is Hispanic, uh, about 18% uh, black, 15% Asian. So again, uh, a very different uh, type of population uh, than we think about in many of the other groups. We have a huge extreme of incomes. So we have about 10% uh, who actually have only completed grade school, that is up through sixth grade, 65% who had more than high school. I'm not showing you the range of incomes here, but we have many, many individuals who earn less than 15,000 for an individual income. So a very, very diverse population in terms of socioeconomics. We tend to group people in terms of exposures in different ways. Simplistically, we group people as whether they were a resident, a cleanup worker, a local worker, uh, or uh, uh, other, which would include here students, commuters, and passers-by. And as you can see, 50% of our group were individuals who were working or local workers uh, on, uh, in the area. About 30% were local residents, and 11% are cleanup workers, with a much smaller group of students, commuters, and passers-by. We also ask, were you in the dust cloud or not? And about 50% of our population reported having been in the dust cloud on 9-11. So that's a huge group of individuals with a acute high-intensity exposure. 
We do think that these exposures mean something. I'm not going to give you detailed data, but for example, we think that there, and I'm showing you here, odds ratios or risk, whether dust cloud puts you at risk for developing wheezing. Here's an unadjusted odds ratio, very significant. An adjusted odds ratio where we put, where we also included age, gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. Both of those, no matter how you look at it, having been in the dust cloud on 9-11, is a risk factor for having developed a lower respiratory symptom, such as wheezing. We are uh, um, showing you data here in terms of scoring for mental health. That doesn't mean they have these illnesses. It just means they scored positive on our questionnaires. And what this shows us is that, in fact, many of our population did indeed score positive. Uh, we have about 40% scoring positive for PTSD. 50% uh, scoring positive for depression, many scoring positive for anxiety, and a small number with alcohol abuse. So this tells us, again, that there is, as you heard from David's uh, report, again, in this population, very, very significant mental health needs. Again, if you look at was exposure related to these, and this is, again, very simplistic. I'm just showing you to, to, as an example that, um, in fact, uh, this is asking whether dust cloud was a risk for developing PTSD, and certainly whether one looks at this as an unadjusted odds ratio, the p-value is very significant, or an adjusted odds ratio, the p-value remains very significant. So again, we can look at exposures and risk. This doesn't mean dust cloud is the only risk. It just means it is in and of itself a significant risk for developing PTSD in this population. As David showed you, we have a lot of certified conditions. Uh, our group is very similar to what you're going to hear about in the other groups. About 50% of our population is certified for an obstructive airways disorder, asthma, emphysema, COPD, bronchitis. Uh, so again, that's the most common uh, thing that, uh, that's bringing our patients in. We have a lot of people also certified for upper respiratory disorders, rhinitis, sinusitis, sinusitis again, very common huge number with uh, certified for uh, the GI disorders such as GERD, a smaller number with interstitial lung disease, uh, and again, we're going to talk a little bit about cancer. So similar to what you're going to hear. So despite differences in populations, differences in exposures, we're seeing a lot of the similar, similar uh, illnesses that you can hear about, uh, that you heard about in the firefighters, that you can hear about in the, in the responder program. Similar also to what David said, many, we have a lot of comorbidities. So here, for example, are individuals enrolled in our program who are certified only for medical conditions, about 50%, but a huge number are certified for both medical and mental health conditions, and a smaller number are certified for mental health only, in part because actually we couldn't include people in the very beginning until we had federal, actually city and then federal, uh, if people just had mental health illnesses. So, again, what you're going to hear about over and over are the comorbid conditions that we're going to see in all of these populations, and uh, it's in every population. Finally, uh, you've heard that we uh, are able to certify patients for cancer. We cannot give you prevalences of cancer. Again, we're not a screening program. We're a treatment program. People come in uh, and self-identify as having these. They self-refer themselves. So we can't give you denominators of cancers. What we can say is that we're a little different than the, than the other programs, in part because we have so many women. So in contrast to the firefighters and the uh, responder program, the most common cancer diagnosis we have is, in fact, breast cancer. So that suggests we need to start looking at that. Uh, is that because we have so many women, or is there an issue with that? We don't know the answer. We also have many people coming in, like the firefighters with prostate cancer. We have a lot of hemologic. We have some lung cancers. We have a diffuse or a very diverse number of cancers. And I think that that's going to start telling us all something also, which is that we're not talking about one organ affected, but we're talking about some underlying risk uh, that's making these patients come in with all of these different cancers. And I think over the next, hopefully not 75 years, but next many years, we're going to have to start teasing out what is putting people at risk and what risks are they at and for which cancers. 
So I want to stop here, except to acknowledge that there are many, many people involved in this program. Uh, we have a, a data management uh, program, and that includes Edith Davis, Terry Miles, Scott Penn, many of the other people you see here, some of whom are in this room. We have a clinical oversight committee. I'm only giving a few of the people. This has been a longstanding program with many, many people involved. And we also have a data anal analysis group uh, who have stuck to us despite the fact that we've all had to learn about biostats, and we, some of us are very simplistic in it, uh, and they have managed to sort of drill into our heads some biostat basics, and we're very appreciative. So I'm going to end with that and um, be glad to take questions. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Prezant and Dr. Reidman because they did a lot of heavy lifting for me this morning because I, I come last. Um, I mean, the original intent of our segment to give an overview of the programs was to provide an overview and at times clarify differences between the programs. However, as you will see today, the mission remains the same, to provide excellence and care to those affected and afflicted with World Trade Center related conditions. My name is Laura Crowley. I'm the Deputy Director at the Mount Sinai World Trade Center Program and I work under the direction of uh, Dr. Michael Crane. Um, he's the PI of the Mount Sinai World Trade Center Program. So I'm gonna start by outlining a couple objectives in the next 10 minutes. We're gonna outline possible exposures, identify and define the uh, groups of individuals that were affected by the 9-11 attacks, and uh, discuss the range of exposures. In addition, we'll talk a little bit about acute and long-term consequences, and then kind of sum it up about our multidisciplinary approach throughout the program. Many of you are very familiar with the pictures that I've just shown, especially uh, they tend to resurface around this time of year. Unfortunately, many of our patients, these, these photos are ingrained um, in them, and uh, are reminders on a daily basis due to their World Trade Center illnesses that, are, that they're afflicted by today. The dust. The composition, quite complex. It was a toxic brew filled with asbestos, cement dust, glass fibers, PCBs, lead, many toxic compounds, including benzene, dioxins, diesel fumes, and sulfur dioxide. Certainly a toxic brew. An estimated 90,000 people responded to the hazardous sites and were afflicted in different ways. Some had the acute exposure where they were caught in the dust cloud that was created by the collapse of the buildings or were exposed to the debris on that day. Others had a chronic exposure. They participated in the rescue and recovery efforts and were there day after day, month after month, participating in cleanup and continuously exposed to either resuspended dust or in small areas where they were cleaning up buildings. The responders included many. The firefighters, as Dr. Prezant outlined, paramedics, law enforcement, construction, operating engineers, those folks from OME, and volunteers. And the responsibilities were diverse. They went from rescue and recovery to restoring essential services to clean up and certainly deconstruction of the materials. Traditional responder. I mean, it's important for us to really recognize that this was a unique experience. We had those folks who were trained and those who were, who, who were untrained. The trained responders were the firefighters, paramedics, and law enforcement officers. And then, those were, then there were the non-traditional responders who came in, the construction workers, the laborers, the telecommunication, the transit workers and the volunteers, and many had no formal training. We are grateful today that our program is administered by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and we are thankful Dr. Howard is here with us today. Today we have over 60,000 over 60, responders are enrolled and certainly eligible for monitoring and treatments. We provide mental health care, physical health care, and benefits counseling and we cover World Trade Center for certified conditions through the program. What is a World Trade Center related condition? 
Well, the definition for our program is it's an illness or a health condition for which exposure to airborne toxins or any, any other hazard or any other adverse condition resulting from September 11th is likely to be a significant factor in aggravating, contributing to, or causing illness or a health condition. We think about that question every day when we see our, our patients in the office to determine if what they're indeed experiencing is a World Trade Center related condition. And when we think about that, we compile documents and we make a case. And then we present that to our World Trade Center program administrator for them to review and approve. When that review and approval goes through, they become certified for a World Trade Center condition. The conditions. This slide was newly created. It's kind of a cartoon that outlines what many of our responders are experiencing today. They're afflicted by aerodigestive diseases like reflux, asthma, rhinosinusitis. Some of them have interstitial lung diseases like sarcoidosis. Some of them, unfortunately, have cancer. In addition, they have mental health illness like PTSD and anxiety. This slide 15 years ago would not be possible, but today we're in a position where, in the central location, we can actually provide diagnosis and potentially prevent disease. This is a list of the World Trade Center related physical health conditions. As I mentioned, we have the airway and digestive disorders. We also have musculoskeletal disorders due from repetitive injury and in some cases traumatic injury. Covered cancers. Thankfully, our group now is covered for particular cancers. The list is long, but our responders are eternally grateful. We now have the capability to screen for cancers. We can screen for cervical cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer, as Dr. Prasant outlined in his earlier presentation. I'm going to switch gears to World Trade Center mental health conditions. Um, and we're grateful today to have Dr. Fetter today to, to speak to that. There's a long list, PTSD, panic, anxiety, depression, and acute stress. Unfortunately, many of our folks have these, and uh, they tend to have comorbidity related to it with overlap. The depression and panic disorder and anxiety overlap, and they may even have all three in some circumstances. In addition, there's interplay between the mental and physical health. For example, respiratory symptoms may cause psychological stress, and then that's a trigger and reminder of a traumatic event, certainly making their panic and anxiety symptoms much worse. This event today is one of many that truly highlights how integrated all of us are toward one common goal for our patients. It's really critical that we remain vigilant about future consequences by investigating scientific problems, and certainly by having a multidisciplinary approach and a stellar team to do that within the clinical centers of excellence, we're in a good, good position to do so. We have pulmonologists, occupational medicine physicians, GI physicians, oncologists, psychiatrists, and administrative staff dedicated toward this, outreach, retention, and member services, and many others. Challenges. As always, there's challenges with everything, and certainly challenges to understanding the risk of world, the World Trade Center disaster. The exposure wasn't completely characterized. The population at risk was truly not defined. There's mistrust of authority. Certainly, we want to get all of our folks in to see us so that we can care for them. But we did learn lessons along the way that we want to control access to hazardous sites, and we want to register those workers, and we want to be transparent. Ongoing challenges, certainly allocation of proper resources for treatment of physical and mental health conditions. Our population is aging. They're relocating. So we want to make sure we keep in touch with them. There's always going to be a need for ongoing research and funding, and certainly the importance of ongoing communication with patients, advocacy groups, and labor is crucial. We thank you today to our legislative representatives, labor, our advisory board, steering committee, clinical centers of excellence, NIOSH, the administration here, and most of all, our patients. Thank you.
excellent question. Um, fortunately, we have colleagues here at FDNY who've kind of started that process for us by looking at autoimmune disease. Um, and recently there was a paper published to that. I know our group at, at Sinai has a special interest in that and is looking at that today, to date now. Thanks, Laura. Um, we're now going to switch over to the main body of our talks today. Um, uh, looking at the lineup of speakers, uh, there's something that strikes me uh, right off the top. Um, supposedly, right, you're not supposed to find people anymore who excel at teaching, at patient care, and at research, the old triple threat, right? You can't run, pass, and kick. Um, patient care is the running part, in case you have any questions about that. But the next five people who are going to talk to you this morning and into the afternoon excel in those things. And it's just remarkable that our program has attracted the interest and maintained the interest of such an incredibly dedicated and talented group of physicians researchers and practitioners. I am so proud every day to know each and every one of them and to work with each and every one of them. Um, and the next speaker, uh, especially so, Dr. Dave Prezant, I, I just noticed uh, a few minutes ago that we're really running kind of delightfully ahead of schedule, you know, by 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, that's just about enough time to introduce Dave. Uh, it does take a while. Um, he's extraordinary, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of the Office of Medical Affairs for the Fire Department, co-director of the FDNY Medical Monitoring and Treatment Program. He responded on 9-11 to the World Trade Center, was present during its collapse. Uh, he and Dr. Kelly uh, have initiated the medical monitoring and treatment for FDNY. Um, he's the principal investigator for the FDNY Data Coordinating Center. Uh, he served as a member of the EPA WTC Technical Advisory Committee, the New York City Health Department World Trade Center Registry Scientific Advisory Board, and the Governor's WTC Panel and the Mayor's Advisory Board. Uh, he's written extensively. Uh, he writes extraordinarily well, by the way. His papers are absolutely a, a pleasure to read. Uh, on, on pulmonary physiology, firefighter health, and safety since 9-11, uh, his group was the first to describe the WTC cough syndrome and he has published on the topic since. The cough paper uh, is one of the most extraordinary labors of love uh, that I have ever seen. Uh, it, is, it is a masterpiece of the disaster literature. It is really a model for all others to follow. Um, he's not quite that much of a model himself, um, but I want you to welcome him anyway. Please greet Dr. Dave Prezant. Okay, thanks for that little technical timeout. <clears throat> Great intro, but I think the thing to stress there is uh, the collaborative effort amongst all the people within our programs and uh, our patients themselves. And, and also the unique partnership that we've had with, with NIOSH. Uh, I, I don't say this just because they're here today, uh, though I am hoping to get a little extra funding because of it. Uh, but no, but in reality, uh, there's a lot of things that is often said in the press about other programs that the federal government uh, runs. I don't know whether they're true or not, but it's almost universally said that it's top down, that it forces themselves on local government, on local institutions. And, and that has not been the issue here, the process here. Of course, they are leaders, they have fiscal responsibility, they have requirements, but they have been a partner with us from day one, and their goal has been the same as our goal, which is prior, first and foremost, the care of the patient. Uh, and th that's just an amazing thing. So I, I think it, it really deserves noting. None of this would be possible otherwise. So as I said to you before, we, we are unique in that we are a single clinical center. We have multiple sites, but we're a single clinical center uh, and a single data center that's fully integrated together. Uh, and because of that, every patient that we see, every clinician that practices, 
is actually part of the data center as well. The other thing that is very unique about our group is that we had done some research before, mostly in terms of healthcare surveillance. Uh, we were the first to show that sarcoidosis was increased in firefighters before 9-11. Uh, we did some work with uh, firefighters, uh, management, and unions in terms of uh, protective equipment. Uh, and therefore, before 9-11, we had a really credible relationship with our workers, both as patients, because we were treating them, as well as a growing understanding of the value of being able to ask questions and then provide answers. And when 9-11 hit on all of our minds, first and foremost was assessment and treatment. But we didn't have to introduce the topic of analysis and research. Our members, our unions, they were part of that process. They valued it as well as we did. And they realized that every one of our members would want to know what happened. Right? And time has proven that to be true because, as I said, Every one of our members, when they come in for, for treatment, they tell us two things. They ask us two things. Number one, how am I doing? Followed by, how are my buddies doing? Right. Remarkably, followed by a third statement, usually, no matter how ill they are, that they would go down there again if they had to do it all over. And what we have found is that there has been some improvement or at least stability over time and with early diagnosis and treatment. And that is something that is often unstated. So here we have our reported lower respiratory symptoms. If we had shown you, which we don't on this figure, uh, symptoms on day one, we would have 100% with cough and sore throat. Uh, this is now expressed on this figure yearly. Uh, and you could see that in year one, uh, over time, this cough, and, uh, which is the uh, top uh, diamond-shaped bar. Do we have a pointer here? Yes. There. Uh, cough is uh, at over 55%. Uh, but that over time, by year 13, and this is true for 14 and 15, but not shown here, uh, cough has actually been the one that's decreased the most. The 9% that are left with cough, we're talking about very severe coughing here. Uh, also, you can see that uh, in here for lower respiratory symptoms, that the other two symptoms, shortness of breath and wheezing, have not had much of a change over time. They were roughly about 35% of the people that were exposed, of the 15,700 that are in our program. Uh, and now they're about 25 to 30%. Some decrease, but still much more persistent than cough itself. We can see the same thing with upper respiratory symptoms and acid reflux. Right? Sore throat, which was dramatic in year one, has actually decreased to about 25%, where the other two symptoms, uh, nasal sinus congestion and acid reflux, have been pretty steady despite treatment at around 40%. Acid reflux has improved dramatically, but is still persistent. Sinus uh, symptoms uh, have not improved dramatically. And I think that is more to say about the efficacy of treatment than anything else. The sinus medic medications are not as powerful as uh, the acid reflux medications or uh, the lower respiratory disease medications. Now, our major finding uh, was, uh, right from the onset, the reduction in pulmonary function. And uh, here is, once again, a uh, really only exists because the fire department had a monitoring program that both labor and management supported before 9-11. So if you see here at the bottom of, the, of each of these bars uh, in a solid color, uh, is the annual decline in lung function. And it's roughly about 30 milliliters per year. This is before 9-11. This is what you'd expect in a predominantly middle-aged male cohort, right, ranging between 20 and age 60. Right. It demonstrates that self-contained breathing apparatus is actually effective for 
firefighters, since that their annual decline, on average, is no different than the general U.S. population. But now, look what happened in just the first year after 9-11. Instead of the expected 30 milliliter decline, there was on average a 372 milliliter decline. We're talking about 12 to 13 times the expected decline in lung function. And this is not compared to some arbitrary number in the general U.S. population. This is compared to themselves because they were able to compare that post-lung function decline to their own pre-lung function decline. We're the only workforce that has this data, and we only have it because of this joint labor management health program. Now, the other thing you can see from this figure is that there was an exposure response gradient. This is the first time, our first study, where we did show this exposure response gradient based on initial arrival time. So you can see a slightly higher uh, de decline in lung function in those people who were present uh, the morning of 9-11 uh, as compared to those people who arrived at later time periods. Critically important in determining causality. Now, when we plot this a little bit differently, you can see here in the initial years before 9-11 that there was this roughly 30 milliliter per year annual decline, normal expected in uh, aging uh, middle-aged males. And then there was the 372 milliliter decline. And the only reason why we were able to see this decline is because we knew what they were before. But that raised an important question, a very obvious question. What's going to happen thereafter? And you could speculate that there would be possible three pathways. Number one, uh, hopefully, uh, people would recover and they would uh, eventually reach their expected curve, the curve that they were on. So if it took them several years to recover, they would ultimately hit this curve at some time point. We know that in smoke inhalation, uh, residents or firefighters that are caught in a smoke inhalation event, they usually are capable of recovering in about three months. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would expect them to get up here pretty fast. Alternatively, uh, they could not recover at all, but not deteriorate further. This could be an initial acute insult, and then they would just stay the same and now follow their age-expected decline thereafter. And what would be terrible uh, is if the third possibility occurred, which is that they would continue on an accelerated decline, something greater than expected based on normal aging. Uh, if it was uh, a mild uh, acceleration, that would be one thing. If it was a very continuous, rapid acceleration, that would be an epidemic of uh, true fatality. So that was the question we raised, and our monitoring program allowed us to answer that question. Uh, and this is uh, our most recent study. We looked at the first seven years and published that in the New England Journal of Medicine, and then we've relooked at that just this year and published the last 13 years uh, in CHEST, and this comes from that. It's a very, very busy slide, but I think I can highlight to you the most important aspects. The most important aspect is that there was this decline that we've talked about previously, 372 milliliters on average. And then, if you put all of these lines together, you basically have a straight line. And what that says is that on average, for the entire group of both EMS and firefighters, their lung function remained the same, adjusted for aging. So they did not recover. They did not have a further accelerated decline. They were that middle group. They were the group shown here that would not recover, but stay have this persistent decline in lung function. So that this line, if you put them all together, is straight. Why are there multiple lines here? Because we try to uh, differentiate firefighters from EMS workers. EMS workers had a dramatic decline, but not as large as firefighters. Mm -hmm. They started at a slightly lower level because they don't have the same health requirements for entry into the workforce. But amazingly, even though they are not firefighters, they had a dramatic decline in lung function 
of way over 250 milliliters in the first year. And then thereafter, like the firefighters, they had this persistent abnormal lung function. And we also tried to look at uh, on, uh, initial arrival time. And while initial arrival time explains much of what was going on in the initial drop, it does not make a difference in the subsequent years. And that's to be expected because the initial drop is based on acute inflammation and you might understand that there'd be more acute inflammation with a greater exposure. But the subsequent lung function trajectory is based on the host response. Right. How does that host deal with inflammation? And that really shouldn't be impacted by their initial arrival time. Right. And how they deal with that inflammation is going to allow us, once we understand it better, to be able to separate out this average curve right, to finding those workers who are not following the average. Right? Because while, the av while this curve represents the average, the average of all 15,000 workers, there is a group all right, that is having an accelerated decline, and there is a group that did have full recovery. And we now want to tease out those differences to so look at this more than just a compilation of averages, but a compilation of specific groups at risk. One of the other key findings was that this is not a disease of cigarette smoking. Too often, diseases are blamed on cigarette smoking. While cigarette smoking definitely impacts lung function, <laughs> and definitely impact a host of diseases. Right? Our initial findings of that 372 milliliter decline was, did not demonstrate a difference in cigarette smokers. So everyone had this type of decline. Right? But what we have found subsequently is that cigarette smoking makes a difference in your outcomes. So you can see here that the people who never smoked and the people who quit before 9-11-01 have a much higher curve than at the bottom here, the people who are continuing to smoke. And in the middle here, this curve is people that stopped smoking before between 9-11-01 and 2008. They're doing better than the recent deck smokers and the current smokers. This tells us a lot of things it tells us that while smoking didn't have a real impact on the disease itself, on the decline itself, not smoking or tobacco cessation has an impact on the trajectory of your future. And it emphasizes what we and labor and management did together. We viewed 9-11 as a reachable, teachable moment for tobacco cessation. And in our firefighters, we now have less than 7% that smoke cigarettes. We used American Red Cross funding, American College of Chess Physician funding, and then NIOSH funding to have a very active tobacco cessation program. And this curve here, this curve here of smokers who stopped after 9-11, but before 2008, demonstrates that that was worthwhile demonstrates that every patient has at least some control of their outcome. And we're hoping that over time, we can demonstrate that those who are recent ex-smokers will be improved compared to the current smokers, which hopefully will become smaller and smaller. I talked to you about the fact that while these are averages, hidden in the average are subgroups that are particularly sensitive to this and have had an accelerated decline in lung function that has persisted. Right. We need to tease those people out so that we can identify them and provide them with more aggressive treatment. Right. And we're trying to do that in collaboration with NYU, with Dr. Wyden and Nolan. Uh, we have been looking at biomarkers for acute and chronic inflammation, biomarkers that could predict accelerated decline, persistent accelerated declines, and could predict recovery. And these are just some of the ones uh, that have already been published. This group has published 
uh, nearly 10 papers now on various different biomarkers in small pilot studies that we now want to uh, bring out to our larger cohort uh, to be able to identify those people who might benefit from some of the new uh, biologicals that are available uh, to counteract chronic inflammation from eosinophils and from other cells. Now, with this lung function decline, there's the question of what diseases are actually present. What's the, the, the mechanism, the physiology behind this? Because that also helps us to treat these patients. If you had predominantly what we call interstitial or restrictive disease, scarring, diffuse scarring of the lungs, that would be really, really bad. Right? Because there's really no treatment for that currently except lung transplant. And we've had a few patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but thankfully only a few. Right. There are certain things in the lung function exam that would make you suspect that there would be a lot of people with restrictive disease. So we had to do further testing to identify this. And this is, again, a complicated slide. But what it shows with some of our other studies in concert is that predominantly this is not restrictive interstitial lung disease. This is obstructive airways disease. And obstructive airways disease, whether it's due to asthma or chronic bronchitis or some combination of it, which we typically call COPD, uh, is amenable to treatment with bronchodilators, with inhaled steroids, and with other uh, anti-inflammatory agents. And what this slide shows on the y-axis is the FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume in one second. It's a measurement of lung function. Uh, and what it is, is uh, on the y-axis is a ratio of the FEV1 measured immediately after 9-11 divided by the FEV1 that had been measured immediately before 9-11, as close as possible. So if you're less than one, you've had a decline in lung function. So if you're less than one here, your lung function has declined. And then on the x-axis is bronchodilator response. Interstitial lung disease does not respond to bronchodilators. Obstructive airways disease does. As you can see in this figure, the greater the reduction in lung function after 9-11, the more likely you are to respond to bronchodilators. Similarly, the greater the reduction in lung function after 9-11, the more likely you are to have air trapping not shown here are some CAT scans that we've done on over 3,000 people that demonstrate the same thing, air trapping rather than interstitial lung disease. And we've also done methacholine challenge testing. Now, methacholine challenge testing is very intense, so you can't do it in thousands and thousands of people. But in those people that we have done it on, we have found that about 25% are hyperreactive, respond to methacholine, consistent with an asthmatic response, consistent with obstructive airways disease. Now, this is a new study that was just recently published uh, by Dr. Aldrich in our group. Uh, and what it did was is it called back people who had had this testing from us right after 9-11 in the first two years after 9-11 and called them back and said, we want to see how you're doing. I, I know you've been in monitoring. I know you've been in treatment. Maybe you're doing great, maybe you're doing not great, but we want to actually repeat the methacholine challenge test on you and find out specifically how you are doing. So this is the longest longitudinal study of methacholine hyperreactivity in the literature, not just for the World Trade Center, but for any occupational exposure, all right, to bring back people over a decade later. And what it showed was that, yes, there are some people that have improved and there are some people that have worsened, but as a whole, for these roughly 120 or so individuals, there was no change. There was the persistence of hyperreactivity. And what we need to do now is, again, by looking at those inflammatory biomarkers and other measures, we need to identify uh, who are these people as compared to these people. But what we have shown is that hyperreactivity, for the most part, persists. The other thing not shown on this slide that we showed in this paper is that hyperreactivity hyper is a predictor for that small group of patients that continued to have a decline in lung function years after 
So while most people had that initial decline and then just persisted, those people who were hyperreactive had continuous decline, more than we'd expect in our cohort. Again, this is trying to find out what are predictors, not because we want to write papers. I mean, that's, we write the papers so that we can inform people. The real value of this is to be able to identify the patients and provide them with specialized care. And those people who are hyperreactive are more symptomatic, right? especially in terms of provocability. So this isn't some isolated lab test. This means something. Right? These people are, are going, have, are, have answered our questions on our monitoring exam, uh, and this is using our monitoring exam data. They've answered questions, and the ones that are hyperreactive wind up answering compared to the ones that are not, that they're more short of breath, and most importantly, that they're more provocable with irritants, perfumes, dust, allergens, exercise. Now, in terms of certifications, we talked about the fact that lower respiratory disease, we have over 5,000 people that are certified with it. But what are the specific diagnoses? And you can see here that, for the most part, these diagnoses are asthma and chronic bronchitis. But the other thing that you can see is that, again, there's an exposure response gradient based on initial arrival time. And you see here in the blue bar that for each of these diagnoses, whether it be sinusitis, an upper respiratory disease, whether it be acid reflux, whether it be chronic bronchitis or asthma, you can see that there's an exposure response gradient with the greatest percentage of those people uh, having the di that specific diagnosis if they've arrived on the morning of 9-11 and the least percentage if they arrived after day three, after the rains occurred. This is not to say that chronic exposure doesn't mean something. It's to say that in our group, which had massive acute exposure, we are able to separate out risk based on that acute exposure. The other speakers, Dr. Crowley, Dr. Ryman, talked about comorbidity and the huge comorbidity in terms of physical health conditions and mental health conditions. And I wish I had that slide, but this slide talks about the comorbidity within physical health and the comorbidity within mental health very similar to the slide that Dr. Crowley just showed. And you can see that amongst firefighters, there's large numbers of people, large percentages uh, when you summate them that have more than one mental health problem. That our biggest problem now is depression, not just PTSD, but that these percentages have both. And you can see on the physical health side, all right, that while we have a big problem with obstructive airways disease and with rhinosinusitis, 25%, 30%, we have lots of patients with both. And what that means is that this inflammatory response is affecting more than one organ. What it means is that the mental health response is affecting more than one issue. Understandably, people with chronic PTSD who have had to retire early who have a change in their lifestyle are going to migrate towards having a depressive diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And it means that we have to treat multiple things all at once. It's hard enough to treat one disease. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about treating multiple diseases. Let me just give you one example of what that really means. If you have mild asthma, you'll probably be on two inhalers. If you have moderate asthma, you'll probably be on two or three inhalers and maybe a pill. That's hard enough for people to remember. But we have patients with sinus problems and asthma and GERD. So they're going to be on the three asthma medicines. They're going to be on one, two, or three acid reflux medications, depending how severe their acid reflux is. And they're going to be on some sinus medications, which is two sinus sprays, some sinus washes, and maybe some pills. That means they're going to be taking about 12 medications, some of which twice or three times a day. Now throw in a mental health problem Normal people who are completely without stress, anxiety, or anything else would have trouble taking 12 medications. Now add someone who's stressed, anxious, et cetera, maybe have some cognitive problems and expect them to be compliant with their medications. We have to do more case management. This is a very special group of people. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned to you that the biggest issues are obstructive airways disease in terms of the lower respiratory problems, but we can't ignore the interstitial lung disease. We are thankful that it's not as prevalent as the obstructive airways disease, 
but yeah, these are truly significant illnesses. Uh, the first thing that we looked at is sarcoidosis, and this is because of our long-standing interest in sarcoidosis in the New York City Fire Department. Uh, there have been many studies on sarcoidosis trying to find an etiology of it uh, unrelated to fires and, and everything else, and the uh, etiology remains in question. Probably sarcoidosis is lots of different diseases put together, uh, all with a very similar multi-organ system inflammatory response. But studies over the last 40, 50 years have always come back to uh, some possible linkage to burning wood. Right? Uh, in Georgia, burning pine trees. Uh, in various different countries, people that have wood-burning stoves. Uh, this is probably sort of like the first biomass uh, disease that people were really aware of uh, in a way. But uh, because of that correlation with burning, uh, we were interested in sarcoidosis in the fire department even before 9-11. Uh, and we demonstrated uh, in uh, 1996 uh, that sarcoidosis was increased in firefighters. Uh, so with that interest and with a healthcare surveillance program that had already been set up for sarcoidosis, we were able to very rapidly uh, move into looking at sarcoidosis uh, in the New York City firefighters after 9-11. So what you see here uh, is before 9-11, we were averaging uh, about five cases per year in a uh, firefighter workforce of 11,500. And then after 9-11, uh, we had an increase. Uh, these are raw numbers. When we re-express this uh, based on incidence numbers, these are still increased compared to what you'd expect in uh, various different, from various different studies uh, uh, in the general U.S. population or in specific uh, cities or counties uh, that uh, are more demographically matched to the New York City Fire Department. So this is a real increase in incidence. But for a lot of people, sarcoidosis, after they get over the anxiety of the diagnosis and realize that it's not lymphoma, for, for a lot of people, sarcoidosis, uh, while it affects them, has very minimal effect on their quality of life, thankfully. Uh, so we wanted to find out uh, not just about the incidence of this disease, but what organs are being affected, and is this a continuous problem or is it resolving? The literature suggests that in non-firefighters, non-World Trade Center, that sarcoidosis resolves in about 30% of people, and that it doesn't have a major impact on serious life-threatening uh, organ systems, uh, except in about maybe 5 to 10% of people. So we wanted to look at both of those issues. So the next slide uh, looks at uh, where they are uh, a decade later uh, after diagnosis, what organ systems are affected or not affected. Now, all of these people were diagnosed with intrathoracic sarcoidosis. It was involving their lungs and or the lymph nodes in their chest. And that's the most common site for sarcoidosis, the most common site for its diagnosis. A decade later, on average, we were able to follow 59 of the 75 people. There are about 90 people that have been diagnosed to date, but we closed this study in 2013. There were about 75. So we were able to bring back nearly all of those patients. And we did a uh, very extensive examination, not just uh, self-report or, or history, but actual imaging on these patients to determine which organ systems are involved. Uh, we repeated their CAT scan to see if it was still involving their lung or lymph nodes. And what you can see here is it was involving that in about 46% of the patients, which means that it resolved in a little over 50%. We would have expected resolution in about 30%. Now, the literature is not exactly clear on that, so I'm not exactly certain that there's a difference between 50 and 30%, but it's certainly better than what we expected, which is good news. On the other hand, what we can see here is a large number and percentage of people with joint involvement. Uh, and there was a question before about rheumatologic disease. We've seen a large number of our sarcoid patients 27%, with serious rheumatologic involvement, much more serious than you would expect in a typical sarcoid population. And we've published separately on this, showing that they really didn't even respond to standard therapy like Plaquenil or steroids, but they required uh, biologicals and more expensive meds. 
But of real important note is that it's affecting 12% of them, uh, the SAR code was affecting their heart. And half of these people have required auto defibrillators, which have been life-saving. This is an example of research saving lives. These three people uh, that needed the auto defibrillators and the other three that are now going to need very close monitoring, uh, we have saved them from uh, the potential for sudden death. Uh, I'm going to, uh, running out of time, so I just want to uh, conclude with the fact that uh, we demonstrated that cancer was modestly increased in this cohort. Uh, this is a way of looking at it in different statistical analyses, but most of the analyses demonstrated a significant increase. This looks more specifically at which organs we found the cancer to be increased. The blue bar is World Trade Center exposed. The other color is non-World Trade Center exposed. And you can see that there are, uh, and a number one would be the same uh, incidence uh, as the, the same risk as the general U.S. population. Uh, so if you're above this line, you're at increased uh, risk. And you can see that there's a tremendous increased risk for thyroid cancer and to a lesser extent, but increased for hematologic cancers. And this slide is even more important because it shows the numbers of patients that we were uh, able to have early detection of cancer in. And what we're hoping is that early detection leads to early, uh, leads to better survival rates. So these are people that had their cancer found at the monitoring exam by the screening programs that you asked about that would not have normally been found. They were found prior to significant symptomatology. Thyroid, lung, some of the hematologic malignancies, kidney. And then uh, my final slide speaks to the rheumatologic question that you had, which is we've looked now uh, in two different ways uh, comparing our cases of rheumatologic disease uh, with uh, similar uh, case uh, matched controls and also comparing it to a similar demographic population in Olmsted County. And both ways of comparison have demonstrated an increased uh, uh, odds ratio for um, rheumatologic diseases when you combine all the rheumatologic diseases together other than sarcoidosis, which we had already shown to be increased. Uh, and specifically, we're seeing an increase in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, myositis, uh, lupus, uh, and possibly some of these other diseases. So what have we learned? We've learned a lot of things. Uh, but for the most part, what we've learned is that you have to fully integrate monitoring, treatment, and research. Research is not a dirty word. We would not know about these illnesses if we hadn't been doing this research. We would not have been able to change from advocacy to data-driven advocacy if we had not done this research. And we would not be able to identify what treatments are necessary for the members that have been exposed if we had not been doing this research. And as Dr. Crowley said, once you identify this, you need to provide treatment in a multidisciplinary approach. But none of this would be possible without broad support. And luckily, we had that broad support from labor, from management, and from, from normal citizens uh, who spoke to Congress and said, this funding needs to be done. I'd like to conclude then with saying that uh, what you see here is the greatest example of plagiarism known to mankind. Uh, none of this is my work. It's all my people's work. Uh, so uh, there have been a lot of people who have been involved with this, uh, many of whom are in this, office, uh, in this uh, auditorium today. Uh, we have people from the New York City Fire Department in collaboration with Montefiore and Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We have people at NYU who have been doing some of our biomarker research. We've been expanding our research for cancer biomarkers uh, with Sloan Kettering and with uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, it, it's just a phenomenal group of people. Uh, there are many that I haven't even mentioned here. Uh, and this is a research-driven uh, program based on a clinical-driven program. So if it wasn't for Dr. Kelly and Dr. Ortiz and Dr. Koffler and Dr. Marchesano and every doctor that we have and every nurse that we have, and a phenomenal case management group of nurses for respiratory disease led by 
Ms. Turns and for cancer led by Ms. Wilson, the patients wouldn't even be coming and we wouldn't be able to know this or apply this. So I thank them more than anyone else. Thank you. Uh, is this on? I guess it is. It's live. Uh, before I ask a question, Dave, I want to uh, express my appreciation. Uh, one of the benefits of having been around a long time is I've heard your presentations about FDNY uh, pulmonary problems before 9-11. And uh, like the ones afterwards, they were replete with data and information, and I want to congratulate you on all the uh, information you've provided. And I want to congratulate you on demonstrating several things we've seen in other populations, but your experience in getting the firefighters to stop smoking is remarkable, and uh, it parallels uh, Mount Sinai experience a number of decades ago in getting uh, insulators, asbestos insulators, to stop smoking, where over 90% of those who smoked discontinued smoking. And your um, plot of uh, FEV1, of lung function, uh, in the different subgroups show in smokers and those who just recently uh, discontinued smoking, you do have a, the greater loss of lung lung beyond function. what you would expect from annual decline in those who have the additional effects of smoking. So uh, my question is one you kind of teased us with, uh, you touched on. So we have this group of many thousand who show no great change in FEV1. And of course, within them, as you teased us, some get better and some get worse. And you mentioned one, one uh, predictor of worsening, which is hyperreactivity with uh, methacholine. Well, what other predictors of worsening or improvement uh, have you uh, discerned? Well, I, I can't take any credit for this because we've been working with NYU very carefully on this and uh, soon we'll be doing some genetic studies with Einstein on, on this as well. Uh, I think right now we're at the, just the beginning of learning about this. Uh, we've shown that hyperreactivity is definitely a predictor. Uh, the uh, initial lung function that you are is a predictor. We're not able to really demonstrate that with a lot of accuracy because in our firefighters, they, for the most part, started at above 100% of predicted. But in all of our studies, pre-9-11 FEV1 is a predictor of the future. So pre-9-11 FEV1, hyperreactivity, uh, smoking to a lesser extent. But I think there's biomarkers of inflammation that really are going to be the, the, the main drivers in this. And for that, we've been looking, uh, we've seen uh, Dr. Wyden and, and his group has seen that eosinophils uh, are a huge predictor of this. Uh, Dr. Ryman's group uh, was the first to publish that in terms of, I think, predicting symptoms. We are now showing that that predicts diagnoses and also FEV1 decline. Uh, and some of the inflammatory biomarkers that I showed you there, I think, will pan out, uh, especially those that are linked with eosinophils. And by the way, and there are now treatments available, uh, just as there was treatments, just as there is a treatment, uh, Zolaire for. IgE, there are now treatments that have just reached the market, uh, very expensive, uh, that are available for eosinophilic-driven uh, inflammatory diseases. So we're, we're hoping that if we can demonstrate a real link, uh, that we might be able to see if those medications are beneficial. So, uh, David, it's uh, <clears throat> Steve Markowitz. Um, I want to return to Ms. Ross's question about lung cancer screening, can, uh, use of low-dose CT. Currently, the program, and, and this is not, I understand you don't make this decision, but it's a good opportunity for discussion. Sure. Currently, the program uses two risk factors, age and smoking. Those are the only risk factors used, and in fact, that reflects the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. There's no consideration of occupational exposure, World Trade Center exposure, or any other risk factor. 
There is an alternative set of guidelines which incorporate some of those other risk factors. And one of the impressive things about your presentation is that you very clearly demonstrated a major inflammatory event in the lungs for many firefighters. And you demonstrated the uh, persistence of obstructive airways disease, both of those being risk factors for lung cancer. And my question is, why, why can't the program take a broader approach in the use of low-dose CT, particularly going forward, because we're past the 15 years of latency, going forward and moving beyond age and smoking as the only risk factors for consideration of low-dose CT? Well, I think you bring up a very important question, and I wish I had a clear-cut answer for you. Uh, we are studying that, uh, in that while we are doing low-dose chest CT screening based on the screening requirements uh, and those thresholds which we follow, we are also doing low-dose chest CT screening for treatment purposes. And since we have so many people that have uh, unexplained dyspnea uh, or are uh, receiving treatment, uh, there's an opportunity to, prov to obtain these CT scans in a diagnostic mode. Uh, so we hope to have some data on this in the future. Uh, it won't be a complete data set, but we hope to have some data. I think one of the things that we have to balance here is uh, to be able to demonstrate, since this is real, relatively a new program, low-dose chest CT, you've done it in your Department of Energy workers, and now people are doing it nationally, I think we have to balance risk versus benefit. We have to prove to NIOSH, the funders, that the risks for doing this and the people that qualify, all right, are not high. Risks that I am talking about to a very small extent would be cumulative x-ray exposure, which I don't think there's any real evidence that that's going to be a problem, but nevertheless, it's in the literature. And more importantly, that we're able to manage these nodules that you find, that in the 30% of patients that have nodules but not cancers, that there isn't been an adverse risk of uh, inadvertent uh, unnecessary biopsies and resections, et cetera. We have a very good safety profile at FDNY, and we're hoping uh, that uh, publishing the results of our low-dose chest CT screening can open up uh, this to a broader group of people. But it, it, there's no clear answer here. We're delighted to have uh, Dr. Adriana Fetter from the uh, uh, Icon School of Medicine talking about risk coping and PTSD in WTC responders. Dr. Fetter is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai, where she's been a full-time faculty member since 2005. She's the Associate Director for Research at the World Trade Center Mental Health Program and an investigator at the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Program. Her research is focused on PTSD and resilience in trauma-exposed population, and she has led epidemiologic, clinical, and translational research studies in diverse samples of trauma survivors. Dr. Freder has been principal investigator of three CDC NIOSH-funded studies on the longitudinal course and biomarkers of PTSD and resilience in WTC rescue and recovery workers, working closely with pro principal investigators, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Bob Petrixa and uh, Steve Southwick at Yale. Together with Bob, she was recently awarded a new CDC NIOSH grant to conduct a randomized control trial of internet-based psychotherapy in WTC responders with PTSD and investigate genomic viral markers of treatment response. She's also received a NARSAD, I guess that's NARSAD, right? Uh, Independent Investigator Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation to conduct a trial of repeated ketamine administration in patients with PTSD, which is currently in progress. And if that's not enough, folks, she sees patients too. Another triple threat coming your way. Please welcome Dr. Adriana Fetter. Thank you, Michael. So um, thank you for um, having me as part of this uh, conference today. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And um, I'm going to be talking about uh, risk coping and PTSD symptoms in the World Trade Center responders. And this is the work from, uh, that started with a CDC NIOSH um, research contract in 2011. Um, and then uh, moving now for the last four years, we've been uh, working on a, a biomarkers study that's nested in that uh, uh, 
longitudinal trajectory study. So, and, and the biomarker study is funding by, funded by two NIOSH uh, grants without which none of this would have been possible. And I'm the uh, principal investigator of these studies here at Sinai and um, co-principal investigators Rob Peterzak and Steve Southwick at Yale working closely with them. So my talk is gonna have two parts and uh, I might have to r rush through the second part, but the first one I'm going to review some findings of our uh, uh, longitudinal trajectory study of uh, PTC symptoms and findings from our um, web-based survey that was completed by um, over 4,000 responders focusing on um, uh, cumulative burdens and also potentially protective factors, resilience. Uh, and then part two, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some preliminary, prelim, preliminary findings that we have on uh, genetics and specifically FKBB5. Now, some of you I know uh, have heard some or much of these, uh, uh, me present on these findings. Um, so I just wanted to let you know. Um, oh, it went forward. Yeah. Okay, so, um, just briefly, the trajectory study uh, was uh, made possible by us being uh, able to analyze the data that was collected at monitoring at all five clinical centers of excellence. And the idea was to identify predominant, tra predominant trajectories of PTSD, what are the determinants of longitudinal trajectories, and also, um, in addition, with that study, we wanted to field a web-based survey because we felt there were some additional um, things that we wanted to assess, like other lifetime uh, traumas other than 9-11, the responders, and how these affected them, and then other um, additional life stressors, and also um, some potentially protective factors, uh, because at monitoring, um, um, there had been some questions that were included about social support, but there were other things like coping strategies and, um, uh, perceived social support and uh, sense of purpose in, in life actually is one of, uh, has been linked to resilience in the face of trauma in many different um, other studies that we wanted to add. Of course, the web-based survey was administered um, on average. We uh, administered it 12 years after 9-11. And so uh, it, uh, um, you know, we can, we cannot infer causality because it was administered at the last point of our trajectory, um, but it, it does give us a sense of, of what these responders, um, what coping strategies, how are they coping with, with their stress and trauma. So this was, so the work, our original trajectories uh, study, focusing on the first three monitoring visits, what we did is we um, used the cohort, data from the cohort that the data center collected on all, uh, and all five CCEs, and the data had been entered in the data center of almost 11,000 responders, um, about 40% um, were police, 60% were non-traditional responders, so construction workers, volunteers, asbestos handlers, et cetera. And um, those were the num uh, almost 11,000 had completed at least visits, uh, had completed one visit two, one, one two, and three, at least. Um, so that was our original cohort. And um, then what we did is there were almost seven, well, 6,600 responders at the time when we started the web-based survey had provided written consent at the various CCEs to be contacted by future, for future research. And so that's what we did. We contacted or we tried to reach everybody, which was uh, about 60% of that original cohort of 10,835. Um, and of those, we had um, wonderful research coordinators and we had an army of interns, um, sometimes 10 of them at the same time fielding, because about only about 10% would answer the survey by only after the invitation letter and um, at least one follow-up email to, as a reminder. The rest was phone calls. And so the rest of the 90% of those who did answer was because of these interns that were calling and saying, hi, um, remember, and well, did you receive our letter, et cetera. And so we had actually, given that we were restricted by only 61% had agreed to be contacted, but of those, I, I always learned that epidemiologically, the gold standard for a, a good enough survey is 70% and 68% uh, um, 
uh, we were able to get uh, to participate. So we were quite excited. It took a lot of work. And there you see the proportions of um, police and non-traditional responders. And 77% answered online, and about a quarter uh, did it in paper, paper and pencil. And we had 5% of the total were in Spanish, the rest in English. We actually excluded, we didn't translate the survey and everything into Polish or the other, other uh, the other primary language is, is Polish. We, we uh, uh, didn't do that. Um, but almost everybody who completed in Spanish was paper and pencil, and then a significant percent in, in English. Um, and um, we, uh, working closely with uh, Rob Peterzak, uh, modeled the trajectories uh, using latent growth mixture modeling which uh, trajectories of uh, longitudinal PTSD symptom severity. And what that uh, approach, statistical approach does, as uh, uh, many of you might be aware, is it there's no a priori hypothesis. It, it actually discovers groups of responders that um, travel together uh, in terms of severity and, and patterns of increase or decrease of PTSD symptoms over time. Um, so, in order to model the trajectories, what the World Trade Center, the CCEs, had always used from the beginning was a PTSD uh, checklist, uh, the specific version, specific for WTC-related trauma. So, uh, we were, you know, so the question was, um, please, uh, you know, uh, below is a list of problems, and please mark to what extent you've had this in the past month, each of these symptoms or um, concerns in relation to 9-11-2001. Um, so if they had been assaulted or something else had happened to them, they might have higher or fewer symptoms. In general, the brain, the body doesn't distinguish as much between two different traumas, but we asked specifically about 9-11. And so because the data center and the CCEs had collected with this instrument, then this is what we use to measure PTSD symptoms. Um, at time four, which was our web-based survey in this subset of over, over 4,000 responders. And um, one thing I want to say now, we have DSM-5. This is the DSM-4 version that, that we were using at the time. So this paper has just been published in July in the Journal of Psychiatric Research. And so all the things that I'm going to talk about um, before I talk about the biomarkers preliminary findings are published. And it's, it's a very um, compressed. There's a lot of information there, so I won't be able to uh, talk about everything, but I'll just give you a, a flavor. And so, sorry that it's a little bit hard to see, but um, the top one are the police responders, and the bottom one are the non-traditional responders. So the non-traditional responder group is a very heterogeneous group. Um, the largest subgroup in that set is are the construction workers, but there are all kinds of less trained, less prepared, or non, not prepared, not untrained. So we see, as many other groups, have, other groups have shown, that, and now that at 12 years, uh, on average, uh, after 9-11, that still the police responders, uh, the um, three quarters of them, the majority, have no or low symptoms. But still almost 25%, almost a quarter, um, are in the symptomatic trajectories, either very high chronic and a cutoff of 44, as has been shown before, and as you probably know, is a screen positive for PTSD. So you see that the, on average, 52 up there and going up is very high symptoms. And then the, uh, the model, the best fit for the non-traditional responders was a five trajectory. And the only reason why that is because um, it's a slightly larger group, and so we tried not to have any, any trajectory smaller than 5%. So that's why in the police responders we have four, but in the, in the non-traditional responders we were able to separate between a subtly worsening and a steeply worsening trajectory. So you can see that only a bit over half of the non-traditional responders have very low, very low or no symptoms at all. And everybody else, so almost half, have some kind of symptomatic trajectory, either very high chronic or getting worse gradually or very, getting worse more steeply or starting out pretty high and getting better over time but still symptomatic. So this is, um, you know, sometimes when we talk about full-blown PTSD, we miss, um, you know, there's now evidence, some studies from us and other groups um, showing that even sub-threshold or sub-syndromal PTSD is associated with impairment, occupational impairments, uh, social impairment, 
uh, in function. And so this is uh, actually, you know, shows the enormity of the impact on the responders. So in terms of the independent variables, uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but we wanted to look at uh, predictors among sociodemographic characteristics, prior history of um, psychiatric illness, of it having been diagnosed. This is all by self-report, and that was collected also. Um, so these are the, the ones that were collected at, uh, by the CCEs at monitoring visit one, including the list of exposures, and I'll talk about them a little bit in more detail. Um, and then this is what we collected on average uh, 12 years on our web-based survey um, after 11. So we had a list of over 20 medical conditions, and we asked them which ones of these were diagnosed before or after 9-11. So they, uh, and they had to be diagnosed by a um, health practitioner, or physician or nurse practitioner. And then the stressful life, we, we asked about three key, because stressful life events had already been asked about at monitoring. We asked them more recently, had they lost a job or were they divorced um, or separated or did they have problems accessing health care? And then we also asked about other lifetime traumas. So were they assaulted? Um, were they in a serious accident? Um, did they lose a loved one very suddenly? So what's the traditional, traditionally considered criterion A trauma? Um, and then the lower half of the slide are a list of potentially protective and also potentially modifiable factors through intervention um, and that um, might be protective. Although we have to say might because again, they were assessed at time four. so. We don't know what came first. And also, they had mental health treatment, self-reported, since 9-11. So just briefly, I want to show you um, what parts of the survey look like. So this is what they would see online, although it was more friendly in terms of uh, user-friendly. Uh, but these are the list of what we call the type A traumatic events, so severe trauma. So for example, oh, well, if they were in the military, uh, saw something horrible or badly scared, uh, uh, seeing someone die suddenly, get badly hurt or killed, uh, if they were uh, you know, sexual assaulted, sexually assaulted as a child, an adult, et cetera. So real uh, traumas. Um, this is the list of the medical conditions. We took this from something that had been used in epi uh, uh, study NISARC, and we added some very typical uh, World Trade Center illnesses. Uh, so GERD, we added, we added, uh, well, asthma is already there, but uh, we also added uh, sleep apnea, et cetera. Um, preparedness, we wanted to know if they ever took part in any prior rescue and recovery work, if they um, had any classes or simulation exercises, and then from a deployment risk and resilience inventory used in the military, we adapted four questions about how well prepared they felt. But this is asking them many years after 9-11, so of course it's influenced by the current level of symptoms. How well prepared were you, did you feel at the time of your recovery effort for the work that you were um, doing? Perceived social support, this is from the uh, abbreviated version of the MOS social support survey. Um, Purpose in life, uh, again, this has tracked in other studies of resilience, the most strongly with resilience and low symptom levels. Um, so um, my personal existence is from meaningless without purpose all the way to purposeful, meaningful. And then the brief cope, we actually modified it. I, you'll see that I like to color code things. We used factor analyses from prior, um, that had been previously published of the brief cope. So, cope. so for example, the light green ones are actually um, emotion-focused, positive, positive emotion-focused coping. So that has to do with positive reframing, so trying to see the positive in, in, in bad things, like, well, this was a terrible event, but I, I felt like I got closer to some of my peers, for example, or trying to see something and like, I discovered that I was strong, or that's also closely related to uh, post-traumatic growth. The use of humor, 
and also acceptance for things you can't change. Um, you've lost colleagues or you now have an illness. So that's actually been um, shown in, in prior studies of trauma survivors to, to really uh, be adaptive and be associated with lower symptoms, symptom levels. Those three together, we called positive emotional coping. And then, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but the ones in, in, brighter, in brighter orange, self-distraction, denial, and giving up on trying to deal with it. So trying to avoid, to a certain extent, turning to work or other activities to take one's mind off things. It's it not necessarily maladaptive, but if that's one uh, mechanism that one uses exclusively, trying to forget that it happened, or um, it's actually usually tracks more in other studies with PTSD. Okay, so um, I guess I only have very few minutes, so I'm going to go very quickly. But again, this has been recently published, so you can actually pay, uh, uh, you know, look at it a lot more. Just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight among police responders. So these are predictors of the improving, worsening, or chronic trajectory compared to the low or no symptom trajectory. So as you can see, anything that is significant with stars and over higher than one, um, all the, the burden of um, life stressors, traumatic events, especially after 9-11, um, and then number of medical conditions after 9-11, as well as WTC-related exposure severity. The potentially protective factors are in green, and when we put all the types of preparedness that we measured, it was perceived preparedness after adjusting for everything else. This is after adjusting everything for everything. Um, and very important, coping by using substances, as uh, it was presented before, I think you, you had actually those nice overlapping circles, that in those patients of yours who have elevated PTSD symptoms, we, as you know, really, really important to check for um, alcohol, alcohol use, uh, mild, maladaptive alcohol use. Not necessarily everybody has alcohol use disorder or dependence, but higher using. These were, this is what they said were the three most common coping strategies. And avoidance coping was also a predictor of all the symptomatic trajectories. In a couple of things I wanted to highlight in the non-traditional responders, that lower education made uh, a difference in terms of increasing risk. And um, again, I won't be able to go over all the details, but perceived social support, purpose in life, um, preparedness uh, made a difference, a feeling of preparedness. And active coping was potentially protective and also positive emotion coping. And that's important because we're about to start uh, a randomized control trial of um, internet-based psychotherapy where we're gonna focus on, on these things. Okay. So, so again, these things, additional things that we measured uh, have a potential buffering effect and are potentially modifiable. And so there's implications for screening, prevention, and intervention. Briefly, two minutes on the biomarkers study. It has several aims. Right now we've completed uh, about over, we, we um, uh, bring them in in person, uh, our research team, and they, um, it's, we've, we're recruiting participants from each of the main four trajectories, and we've already, uh, 300 respond, over 300 have completed, and we, we're gonna, we aim to finish 400. And um, so basically, from the trajectories, they're selected. And so, just very briefly, th these are the first 307 that came in, and you see that we're measuring additional things like childhood trauma, and the, these are, this is with the CAPS, a clinician in-person interview, clinician administered uh, PTSD. And um, we've broadly grouped patients into current PTSD, past PTSD, now better, at least they're subsyndromal or not fully recovered, and then never PTSD, but that includes a sub-threshold group. And um, you can see one thing that, again, the police responders you see fewer of them, there are many more of them in the no PTSD group. And so I'll, I'll just leave you with a brief, interesting finding that we have with FKBP5, which is a 
chaperone protein, as many of you know, that regulates or modulates the sensitivity of the glucocorticoid receptor. So when cortisol is secreted during stress or released during stress, it binds, um, it, it, it uh, binds to the glucocorticoid receptor and it, it sort of re tries to shut down the stress response appropriately after it starts. And FKBP5 modulates that. And if there's too much FKBP5, there's, um, it, there can be a, a prolongation of the, of the stress response. And FKBP5 relates to multiple targets, including PTSD, medical illnesses, Im immune response, depression, psychosis, and even potentially dementia. And so what we found, um, these are the exposures that we measured. So this, the gene, this is just one gene. We're, we're actually going to be looking at many different candidate genes. But basically, these are the exposures that were assessed at visit one at monitoring. We're assessing them now also, but now there's a, maybe a recall bias. Um, so it's good that they were assessed at time one and extremely careful, as you all know. And so this is what I, so the, in the literature, the risk allele, so basically FKPP5 doesn't increase the risk for PTSD by itself. However, in interaction with childhood trauma, it actually predicts increased risk of PTSD in adulthood. And so, but it has not um, been shown, at least most of the studies, I should say, are focused on, on this interaction with childhood trauma. What this can do, having a, a sample of responders who all were affected by the same trauma but with different histories and different um, genotypes, is what we see is um, the, the risk allele is T. So if you have no risk alleles at that particular SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism, it's almost flat. You have one T allele. It, for every exposure that was measured, your risk of having PTSD of 50, a cutoff of 50 on the caps, is uh, PTSD. And then if you have both risk alleles, by about three exposures, or you're already hitting the 50 on the caps. So, um, that's pretty much all I have to say, and I really wanted to thank the, the team, um, especially uh, coordinators Leo Conselmo and currently Olivia Diab, and Leah Khan, um, who's, who's also here, uh, has done single-handedly most of the interviews um, along with Cindy Aronson, and all our wonderful collaborators also from the World Trade Center program. And I also uh, wanted to um, thank the responders and, of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for um, uh, for funding the studies. Thank you. A quick one. Do you think that the frequency of the polymorphisms, uh, it's different between the police and force and non-police force? And in other words, the personality trait determine the choice so of, that'll of be, job? That'll be really interesting to look at. Uh, we actually, what we looked is right now with the sort of over, we're about almost 200 people that we looked at this. They're divided in two trajectories, so uh, because of the numbers of people. So one, uh, about 50 of them are uh, low sim uh, high symptoms, sorry, and 150, let's say, are the low sim lower symptom. And I know that there are many more police than that other one, but okay. that's actually a very good idea. We haven't looked at that, um, and so that'll be um, that'll be very interesting. Thank you very much, Adriana. And now we um, have a discussion about WTC-related asthma, the risk factors, management, and outcomes by Dr. Juan Mosinvesky. Juan has been involved in several WTC studies assessing the treatment and outcomes of responders. He is currently PI of two U01 grants evaluating factors with asthma control among WTC rescue and recovery workers with a focus on the role of mental health and self-management. He has expertise in asthma and COPD behavioral research. His work as a pulmonary internal medicine researcher has translated into greater than 160, 160 original publications, including first author papers in high impact journals. More triple threat folks, here he comes. Well, thank you for the invitation and for the nice introduction. Um, and so we're gonna move from the brain to the lungs, uh, but hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you will uh, be convinced that there is a strong connection here. So, um, I hope I, okay, so uh, as you know, and from the prior uh, presentations, asthma is a very 
a prevalent condition in WTC workers and responders and volunteers. Um, this is data we published like 10 years after 9-11, showing that you know, over time, the prevalence of you know, lifetime asthma you know, goes up to around you know, 30%, over 40% in those groups, and some groups, and there's a strong relationship here with uh, exposure uh, during 9-11, Again, with our crude measures of exposure, but you know, uh, a strong association. Um, you know, despite these high risks, um, you know, there was a lot of interest uh, in the beginning to show whether you know these rates are really reflect you know uh, higher um, prevalence compared to the general population. Um, obviously, many of the workers uh, were self-selected because. Uh, uh, to entrance in the workforce, so you expect rates that will be lower than the national population. In this study with the Hume Kim, um, uh, we look at the National Health Interview Survey, um, and as you can see here, these are the rates of uh, lifetime asthma in the in NHSI, which is a national population-based sample of a U.S. Uh, 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 individuals, and uh, over time you see a pretty flat rate with around 10%, which is a described prevalence of asthma in the United States, but if you look at the uh, population of uh, rescue recovery workers in the Walter Center program, you see a sharp increase, you know, after 9-11, and then, you know, with slow rise over time. This is also true for, you know, uh, asthma symptoms that last 12 months, you know, showing that depending on the groups, there was a three to four, even up to five, uh, five times the risk of asthma. You know, the other thing that has been highlighted over and over, which impacts the outcome of these asthmatics, is that uh, there's a lot of comorbidity. Uh, here, in case of physical conditions, some of these associated with uh, worse asthma control, like sinusitis and particularly GERD, and how how much level of overlap between these syndromes uh, there is in these um, patients and how it's important to incorporate that in the management. Um, our colleagues and David Prestan and his group in the um, FDNY, early on, well, this is seven, seven nine years after 9-11, they show also increased risk of asthma in this population before 9-11. There was less than 1% incidence of asthma uh, by, uh, by a few years after, 10% of the uh, uh, firefighters show um, reported um, physician diagnosis of asthma. And uh, as in other studies, uh, as uh, in the Walter Center group, uh, a strong association with exposure at 9-11. However, no association with asthma, with uh, smoking. So uh, we are conducting study, we are towards the end of a study where we um, uh, were interested in assessing what are the factors associated with um, both outcomes and self-management of uh, patients with asthma. Uh, we enrolled a cohort of over almost 400 uh, workers uh, from Mount Sinai, Queens College, which again is the center at North Wales and NYU, and we enroll adults with a physician diagnosis of asthma and who speak English or Spanish, and uh, we exclude anybody that have heavy history of smoking or COPD or any other lung disease so that we focus on asthma symptoms. And this is a design we follow patients for a year um, with a very detailed intake, uh, assessing you know, asthma control symptoms, exposures, um, medications, we measure IG levels, did a spirometry, and then also did a structural uh, interview, which is kind of the gold standard for clinical diagnosis of mental health uh, disorders. And then we follow them over a year to measure their asthma, the quality of life, their asthma control, as well as, you know, trajectory of comorbidities, and also a focus on self-management, adherence and uh, to medications. So these are some of the characteristics, you know, at the time of enrollment, the mean age was around 50, 70% were male, because again, these were uh, rescue and recovery workers in the Walter Center program, um, and, you know, around 40% self-identified Hispanic and 20% um, African-American. And, you know, consistent with what we have found in some other studies in the um, New York City, uh, non-WTC asthmatics, there was a significant uh, rate of allergy sensitization in the group with, you know, over 30% being sensitized to dust mice and also cockroaches and cat being uh, frequent um, allergens in this group. 
This is in terms of uh, the uh, levels of asthma control and, you know, treatments that these uh, patients are receiving. Um, and as you can see, um, 25% a quarter have a good no report, no no symptoms of asthma would be like you know well controlled. Where the majority, particularly 50%, having you know reporting symptoms consistent with having very poorly controlled disease. Um, good news is most patients are on treatments, primarily in corticosteroids or combination of those. But it is a subset of patients are, are you know reported not being receiving any medications. Again, this may be some do patients have not seen a doctor recently or that may have been prescribed, but they 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 don't report it. Um, small percentage, particularly in those who have poor control disease. Interestingly, and not surprisingly, with as any patients with chronic diseases, almost half of them reported not being adherent to uh, their chronic asthma medications, which clearly will like have impact on uh, their symptoms. Uh, we just published a study looking at what were the factors associated with poor asthma control in this group, and you know, after adjusting for multiple social demographics and exposure, uh, what we found is that uh, income was a strong predictor of poor control. Uh, similarly, having uh, post 9-11 asthma, being diagnosed after exposure, uh, was also associated with worse asthma control. And then in terms of comorbidities, uh, GERD symptoms uh, with a symptom score scale and PTSD were strong predictors of having you know, poor asthma control. And this is consistent with a study published by Hannah Jordan and her group from uh, the Walter Center Registry in the Department of Health, where they also show, you know, other factors, but, you know, education that could be a proxy for a, a socioeconomic status, but also, you know, G, uh, GER symptoms and, um, and p mental health conditions, in particular PTSD and depression that were strongly associated, independently associated with uh, worse out asthma outcomes, suggesting that obviously, again, uh, mental and physical health comorbidities clearly likely have a strong impact on these patients and need to be co-managed with their asthma. So as I say, we are interested in asthma self-management. It's well established that chronic asthma medications are effective and that also, as I say, many chronic diseases that patients tend not to adhere to medication. So in order to understand this problem, um, which could have a direct impact on other patient management, uh, we use a theoretical framework, which is a framework of self-regulation that kind of propose that patients kind of construct this mental model of disease based on prior exposure to common diseases, and they kind of those uh, beliefs along the domains of what the disease is in terms of certain characteristics of, you know, symptoms, timeline, ability to control, and as well as the emotional responses to disease, such as, you know, being upset, angry, uh, depressed uh, in, in response to the disease, uh, uh, regulates self-management. So um, we measure... Um, um, several of these beliefs um, in this population, and you know, in this uh, in these uh, few slides, we correlate them with adherence. Um, and um, interestingly, and consistent with our studies in uh, non-WTC asthmatics, you know, a, a key predictor of adherence is this belief whether you have asthma all the time or only when you're uh, having symptoms. And you can see that um, among non-adherent patients. Almost 70% reported that they believe that they only have asthma when their disease is active. And that was strongly, as you would expect, associated with uh, not being adherent to medication. Um, this disease in terms of what caused asthma in this population and characteristics of WTC versus regular asthma were not related to adherence. But it's interesting to, to see that the overwhelming majority of uh, patients uh, felt that asthma was due to 9-11 exposure and that um, um, although few less, 30% did not think that was related to airway inflammation. And similarly, many, many of the patients feel that WTC-related asthma is harder to treat. What we did find is there was a strong association between beliefs about the medications themselves for asthma, uh, particularly needing the, need, needing the medication and uh, concerns about uh, inhaled corticosteroids, which are frequent in patients with asthma, and also we find it to be correlated with uh, lack of adherence in um, non-WTC populations, concern about becoming fat, about having side effects of ICS, were strongly associated with uh, adherence. 
Uh, finally, is self-efficacy, which is kind of a construct that measures how confident patients are in following the regimens and being able to take the medications. We're also uh, strongly associated with um, adherence to inhaled corticosteroids. So, you know, you know, to me, this highlights, you know, how important adherence, uh, the problem of non-adherence uh, is in uh, uh, patients with asthma in, in this cohort. And, you know, the possibility that trying to address some of these beliefs uh, may lead to, um, you know, better, better management, you know, and, and hopefully improve outcomes. I think the other issue that was mentioned, which, you know, I highlighted is a strong association with PTSD. You know, this is a, you know, slide showing, you know, high rates of PTSD. These are obviously non-police non uh, responders. And, um, you know, and obviously the big overlap, uh, the high overlap between depression, PTSD, and panic, and all these conditions have been associated in no WTC populations to worse asthma outcomes. So, um, uh, However, most of the studies that relate as PTSD with asthma prevalence has been cross-sectional. And in this recent study that was conducted by uh, Dr. De La Hoz, um, he uh, used data from the WTC cohort to look at um, probably PTSD at baseline associated with new incident asthma during follow-up. So he did a set of nice, elegant analysis, uh, including limiting the whole cohort to uh, patients who have, were non-smokers who have no asthma diagnosis at baseline. And then he shows that after adjusting for multiple covariates, you know, social demographics, also WTC exposure and presence of airway reactivity at baseline, that probably PTSD as measured by the PLC score um, was associated with 2.5 increased incidence of asthma during follow-up, suggesting that there may be like some causal relationship here. Using our data, we uh, were interested in looking at uh, PTSD and also subthreshold PTSD, what was mentioned in, in, in the prior talk, and uh, asthma control. And, you know, also remember that this was done by uh, structural interviews, so these are, you know, equivalent to clinical diagnosis of PTSD. And as you can see, you know, PTSD uh, was associated with most... Uh, measures of asthma control, including, you know, worse uh, uh, scores of symptom scores, worse quality of life, and increased resource utilization. However, subthreshold PTSD was not uh, significantly associated with any, any outcome. In terms of, you know, what symptoms of any PTSD, we found that uh, re-experiencing was kind of the stronger predictor and strongly uh, associated with all asthma outcomes. Um, and where some avoidance was associated with some um, increased uh, symptoms as well. You know, interesting also, you know, when you exclude and we look at the patients without full PTSD, we still found that symptoms of re-experiences was associated with certain measures of uh, poor asthma control, suggesting that, you know, there is some role for potential isolated symptoms even without full PTSD as a, you know, driver for worse asthma um, symptoms. So we are, you know, launching a new study that, um, you know, to try to assess what are the potential pathways that explain this relationship between PTSD and asthma outcomes. And uh, we, we think that, you know, both uh, inflammatory uh, factors such as, you know, PTSD is associated with systemic inflammation and, um, you know, increased levels of potential, increased levels of IL-6 and neut airway neutrophilia, which are... Um, associated with asthma endotypes that are more severe, um, uh, could be uh, related to PTSD itself. So we'll be conducting um, a sputum induction on a large uh, group of uh, asthmatics and, and measuring uh, those markers and correlating that with asthma control, as well as a understanding potentially more uh, behavioral related pathways, which I just mentioned, because it's clearly that patients with PTSD as well as depression, um, those um, mental health conditions can impact the perceptions about the disease, beliefs about the disease, self-efficacy, and how maybe the interrelationship between self-management and more severe asthma endotype all contribute to, you know, the findings that we keep seeing in terms of PTSD being associated with worse asthma control and how we can then 
integrate those all these towards the end of the study to do a pilot intervention to you know co-manage you know both conditions so there are clear limitations in the data i presented you know we relied in these and many of these studies on self-report um, diagnosis of asthma made by a healthcare professional but self-report by patient and you know uh, David has shown in some data from his group that, you know, those are not 100% sensitive or specific, so there's a possibility of misclassification. Um, we have the lack of detailed data about exposure that was mentioned over and over in the prior presentation. So assessing the relationship, you know, causal relationship between exposure and outcomes is difficult. And then, of course, you know, most of these are association studies, so, you know, it's difficult to show causation. So I think in summary, um, well, we I think over and over we know been presented that asthma is a very common uh, condition affecting WTC responders and all the other population exposed to the WTC disaster, that there is considerable comorbidity, both mental health and uh, physical conditions, and particularly GERD and PTSD seem to be associated with worse symptoms, so um, it's important to co-manage those conditions. Um, I think, based on the data that we show, it's also important to focus, as any patient with chronic conditions, on the fact that, you know, adherence may be a problem and that achieving good outcomes or improving their outcomes uh, is important to, you know, tackle these issues, which are not simple, but, you know, it's still critical. And that I think uh, we are learning more and more that managing comorbidities, particularly managing mental health, physical comorbidities, it will be critical for, you know, achieving good outcomes in this population. Let me finish by acknowledging that this is obviously a team effort. Um, Steve Markowitz has been our partner in crime in uh, all these studies, uh, so, as well as the group at um, uh, NYU, um, some other collaborators here, particularly um, Emily, which has been um, the project manager, has been really driving all this work. Um, and many others, which you know, obviously make it uh, interesting, and of course, uh, NIOS for their funding and support. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just leaving. <laughs> she had enough. <laughs> Juan, among the outcomes in patients with asthma are the pulmonary function measurements and such uh, hard clinical uh, statistics as ER uh, visits and admissions. So could you comment on what the range of the pulmonary function is? Many asthmatics seem to have normal pulmonary function when we measure it. Others have intractably bad pulmonary function and how often they wind up in the acute situation. Yes, yeah, so I think you're raising a good point. Uh, we, we had done spirometry, but, you know, again, these are not considered as standard as, the, you know, the same quality as a, a spirometry is done in clinical settings. We see that, you know, FEV1 is depressed, but it's, we, there's many patients that have diagnosis of asthma that have normal spirometry. We are retrieving the lung function from the WTC, so to look at... Uh, the, the water center monitoring program to look at it more detail of this, but um, you know it's a mixed group. Some have abnormal, some have within normal limit as, as spirometry. Um, as you see, in terms of hospitalizations, there is around you know 20 to 25 percent of the cohort that have you know with acute resource utilization in the last year. So, and I think the group at the DOH is working on a manuscript that they have linked their data to Sparks uh, to look at uh, hospitalization and ED visit in the cohort over time. So they, they, they're already ready to publish that. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, actually now we're going to hear from a heart specialist, okay? Uh, so while you're sitting there, tune up your cholesterol. Um, Dr. Marianne McLaughlin is here from uh, Mount Sinai. 
She's a graduate of Georgetown University, trained in internal medicine at New York Hospital, and completed her fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Sinai, and received her master's in public health from Columbia. Dr. McLaughlin is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine. She is the recipient of many awards and grants from the National Institute of Health, so the Center of Disease Control, NIOSH, uh, the American Heart Association, New York Academy of Medicine, the American College of Cardiology, and the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. She is the immediate past president of the American Heart Association Board of Directors in the New York City. Her research focuses on improving healthcare delivery for vulnerable populations. And today she's talking with us about exposure to inhaled particulates at ground zero implications for cardiovascular rich. Would you please welcome with me Dr. Marianne McLaughlin. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure. So today we're going to talk about the relationship between risks um, for heart disease and the association between things you've already heard about. We've heard about PTSD. We've heard about lung disease. And the reason I was became involved in this was when Dr. Jackie Moline was here um, several years ago. She came to me and said, you know, there's the Fraternal Order of Police was interested in looking at heart health in their individuals, and not only just as a research perspective, but really more as a clinical perspective. Um, and the theory is that they were short of breath. A lot of people are short of breath. And sometimes cardiovascular disease actually presents as shortness of breath. So maybe some of the people have a comorbid conditions or multiple conditions. So we're going to talk today about what the physiologic perspective is, like why uh, heart disease could be affected from exposure to particulate matter. And then some specific studies we've looked at, looking at metabolic syndrome, PTSD at risk, obstructive sleep apnea, and diastolic dysfunction, which is you'll learn about. You've heard that there are several different groups, and my research is really focused more on the law enforcement officers. You've seen these pictures. So interestingly, air pollution is a risk for cardiovascular disease and mortality. You don't hear it talked about so much because when we talk about risk for heart attacks, we say, okay, cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, family history are all risk for heart disease. And then a patient's in my office, I'm not going to say, oh, you live in New York City or if it was air pollution, that's another risk. But it is. And if you look back and starting in 1993, there was a large study of six studies, the six cities, showing this relationship between the um, higher date, number of days exposed to air pollution increased in overall mortality. Subsequently, several years ago, there was a group in Germany who actually um, noted that patients who lived closer to more near higher air pollution levels had higher deposits of calcium in their hearts. So we have that as a background. And what I say is that people who were exposed to ground zero received like an exorbitant amount of air pollution or a bolus of air pollution potentially in their lungs that day. These are three uh, mechanisms that are potential mechanisms of how that air pollution or particulate matter, 911, can cause cardiovascular disease. And number one on the left is looking at directly at pulmonary um, into the lungs, uh, pulmonary reflexes being exacerbated, leading to autonomic dysfunction and arrhythmias. We know if you take a mouse and you put it in a, in a little um, room with a fan blowing dust into that face of that mouse for, uh, for days, three things can happen. They can have an acute arrhythmia, they can have a cardiac arrest, or they can survive and then have ultimate problems down the road. Um, and so what we're looking at is this theory of pulmonary inflammation. So there's inflammation that leads to oxidative stress, it leads to unhealthy linings of the arteries or endothelial function, and then ultimately could lead to acute coronary syndromes and heart disease. Again, early on in my relationship with this group, we did a small pilot study, okay, because looking at this, the relationship between the trajectory of what happens when an artery gets, becomes unhealthy and leads to atherosclerosis or heart attack risk. So we see that here we have particulate matter, endothelial dysfunction, leads to inflammation in the arteries, 
and plaques, there's little cholesterol plaques form new blood vessels. So new vascularization of the plaque, they accumulate debris, foam cells, lead to little hemorrhages within the artery, and that's when you lead to heart attacks. So what we did is we, um, we used a method called DC MRI, which is dynamic contrast MRI, which is relatively new look into those arteries to see if we could see things like that. And this is what one looks like on the left when you see the red under the area of the curve, which shows increased plaque formation. And we took a total of 31 um, exposed law enforcement officers, 19 with high exposure and 12 with low exposure, otherwise completely matched on every other risk factor, equal levels of high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. And when we did that, we found that there seemed to be a higher amount of this neovascularization on these MRIs. Now, this is just a hint. It's a small study just to look at the physiology to say, oh, could there be something in this group? And so now those are all sort of physiologic background. I want to talk about the real health effects that are observed. And we used exposure scores that Dr. Wisniewski published in this group here um, several years ago. And again, you've seen this slide um, from Dr. Crowley with, with the added um, in bold that upper respiratory diseases may contribute, we know can contribute to sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a risk factor for heart attacks. So lower respiratory disease, when people have chronic lung disease, the right ventricle becomes strained or enlarged, right? So the right ventricle of the heart pumps the blood to the lungs. If there's resistance in the lungs, it can result in stress on the right ventricle, and it can result in pulmonary hypertension or increased pressures in the pulmonary arteries. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea and its relationship to inhaled particulate matter, PTSD, and I'm not going to talk about autoimmune disorders or inflammation, but someone mentioned it before, um, that that's very important, that now everyone's looking more at the rheumatologic disorders because we know that inflammatory responses increase risk of heart attacks. We know aspirin helps prevent heart attacks. We always thought it's because it thins the blood, and there's some theories that it's also an anti-inflammatory. So that might be what's also having its effect. So... Um, the first group we looked at was 2,497 law enforcement officers. Um, we did um, medical history tests. We did physical measure tests. We measured their weight, their height, their waist circumference. We did echocardiograms, and we did laboratory tests. And in this particular look, we decided to look at metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is a conglomeration of risk factors that has been shown to increase risk for diabetes and then ultimately cardiovascular events. So, and this is going to be a little bit busy, so I'll just try to focus your attention on the second column, the overall column. Um, at the time of the study, the average age was 47. Um, let's see. Smoking rates, I just wanted to point out, are very low in this cohort, 5%. Um, most people, 70%, were never smokers, which is important. Next. We see, um, on average... Um, the men and women in this group were law enforcement officers for 20 years. Um, most of them were still active, 58%. Um, and education was mostly college educated. And then we looked at their other risk factors. In this cohort, around half, a little more than half, had a diagnosis of hypertension um, and high cholesterol. Uh, only 14% had diabetes. Body mass index, most were in the above average weight and a smaller percent were obese. Importantly, I'll direct you to the last level here, the C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a marker of inflammation. It's been shown to be associated with increased risk of heart attacks, no matter what it's from. So if you look, if, you, if your doctor does a test or if you're doing research, if it's less than one, it's a low risk for heart disease. If it's over three, it's been shown to correlate with incre increased risk. So in this group, um, the average is over three. So we know that whatever causes that inflammation doesn't matter. The risk is still greater for heart attacks. And now we're looking at um, what, what is metabolic syndrome. And I said it's a different group of symptoms of the, or, or physiologic changes. So the things that we look at, we look at abdominal obesity, cholesterol, whether the HDL cholesterol is low. We look at triglycerides in the blood. And we look at glucose levels. And that's the group of this, the um, syndrome. And I'll put your attention to the bottom 
If you have three or more of those components, it's considered a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And in our overall cohort, is 27% of our law enforcement officers met the criteria. And again, this is looking at, we were comparing men and women in this group. Um, our women tended to have um, higher rates of um, obesity, actually. Um, and interestingly, those who are retired were more likely to have an increased risk of metabolic syndrome. So when we know that um, we compared this with the, the national NHANES cohort, which is the United States representative sample. And interestingly, the police officers, our police officers, had less metabolic syndrome compared to the national um, levels. And I'll show you where to look. In this last column on the right, in the green, this is the, our, our cardiac program, our LEX program. Um, and then that's the females. And then in the dark green is the males. And the blue is the national sample size. So what that has led us to believe is that when, when uh, subjects become police officers, they are usually in very good health. I mean, the health can change over the years, but they are also, this is a working population compared to the NHANES cohort, which is composed of people who are too sick to work or unemployed or for other reasons. Um, so it's a, it can be a more sick general population. But so this was just a, a good baseline look at our cohort to show what our baseline characteristics was and to show that importantly, one in four of these law enforcement officers are affected by this metabolic syndrome. Um, and it's, it, we could use this as an opportunity in the workplace to set up more um, education and uh, treatment. Subsequent to that initial look, um, we've been funded by the NIOSH to look at this in a study called the Pulmonary Function Abnormalities, Diastolic Dysfunction, and World Trade Center Exposure, Implications for Diagnosis and Treatment. So as I said, there's a relationship obviously between lungs and heart, and so we wanted to see if that the increased risk of lung disease was affecting our cohort, and we wanted to look at the long-term risk of cardiovascular risk. So um, we've heard bef before today and today at length that the PTSD is associated with the World Trade Center. And I mentioned just now that C-reactive protein is this marker of inflammation that portends an increased cardiovascular risk. So we were looking at the relationship here in 816 men and women. And this is just a look at their baseline characteristics. And we can see on the column here, the PTSD group, there were 99 with um, PTSD, and we can see that there's an increase um, risk in hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea. Interestingly, and if you look at the police cohort, while the police were actively working, they were less likely to um, say that they were suffering from uh, psychiatric disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And after the retirement, the rates went up in this group. So on one hand, I say that they're, they're, um, they, they were less likely willing to risk losing their job if they agreed, they said that they had a problem. And number two, I think there's a self-selection of a person type of personality who goes into the police force. You know, they see these terrible things every day. So, you know, they've had a career full of seeing tragedy. So they're a different, different kind of group. Um, so in our results, we found that those who had the highest exposures were more likely to have PTSD. So again, in this cohort of really law enforcement officers, we see what we've seen in other groups here. And importantly, they were more likely to have high C-reactive protein. And so the, this was, even when we adjusted for other cardiovascular disease risk factors, and we adjusted for exposures, this high CRP was significantly related to PTSD. And then we did one quick other look that we, we looked at what's called the Framingham Risk Score. So in cardiology, we use this score in a lot of epidemiologic studies to look for a risk of a uh, 10 year risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And we use variables such as cholesterol, age, smoking status, et cetera. And so if you look at um, this exposure to um, particulate matter and PTSD, the Framingham Risk Score was elevated in those who had PTSD, it was nearly significant. It was a trend towards significance. It didn't quite meet us statistically. 
So in conclusion for this portion, we'd, we can say that PTSD is significantly related to the um, exposure to particular matter. It affects not only the psychology, and now we know lung disease and asthma, as Dr. Wisniewski told us, um, but also should be considered when evaluating cardiovascular risk. The second look we did was about cardiac function. So um, there's something called diastolic dysfunction. Systole, or uh, is systolic function, is the pumping mechanism of the heart. And then the relaxation phase, after the heart squeezes and relaxes, is called the diastole. Um, we know that people who have high blood pressure or obesity or with aging, there can become a stiffness in the relaxation phase of, of, the, of the heartbeat. And if that happens, it leads to symptoms such as fatigue and shortness of breath and then sometimes swelling. So we thought, let's see if you know, we can see that there's any kind of enlargement of the right heart or there's stiffness in the, in the heart. And the way this happened, because when we were funded to do the study, we thought we would see um, so different differences in heart function, and this is what became apparent after the first 50 uh, subjects. And then we developed a more um, significant, like a uh, sensitive test to look at not only the left ventricle, but also the right ventricle in a more detailed manner. This is just a technical um, details to show you that in cardiology, there are a lot of guidelines on how to really evaluate. So we do an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart and measure the pressures across the mitral valve. And there are lots of different, um, you'll see, we, this is an example, lots of different waves or changes that we look at through. These are called E waves and A waves. And there, there's a classification system, very detailed classification that we went through that we could classify whether there was a stiffness in the heart. And what we found, and because we know that people who are older or who have um, obesity or who have hypertension are at risk for this disorder, we excluded them from this analysis and showed, in fact, that 53% of our group had this diastolic dysfunction. Um, when we looked at the right ventricle, um, we saw that 59% had abnormalities of the right ventricle. Remember, the right ventricle is associated with lung. So it was very striking results in this group. Now, importantly, these patients, compared to patients I see in my office who come in saying, oh my gosh, I'm short of breath, my feet are swollen, I can't, you know, I really don't feel well, and I'm, I'm looking for this, these men and women were not, they might have had some shortness of breath, which they said was their asthma or they had their PTSD, but they weren't particularly symptomatic yet, or they were misaligning their symptoms with their lung disease. Okay. Um, so next we're gonna talk about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, we know that obstructive sleep apnea is associated with hypertension, increased risk for arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation, um, and events, cardiac events. Um, okay. So we wanted to look, we already knew at this time that the fire department had noted an increased risk to exposure to obstructive sleep apnea, but we weren't sure if we would see the same in a non-firefighter group that had less exposure to particulate matter. And in fact, we did show that high risk for sleep apnea, as tested on a Berlin questionnaire, was associated with a high, higher um, exposure. So finally, we wanted to look at, OK, we know we have, now we know there's an increased risk of PTSD with exposure. We know there's an increased risk of sleep apnea with exposure. We know we have a high amount of LVDD, or left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Is there a relationship between the two here? In this cohort, we looked at 1,540 patients, and we, we did the echocardiograms. And we found, if you look at the bottom line here, that those who had to screen positive for saying they had risk for OSA had a higher, significantly higher chance of having that left ventricular diastolic dysfunction or stiffening of the heart muscle. And this is just showing that data. We adjusted for other risk factors such as diabetes, increased thickness of the heart, which is left ventricular hypertrophy, ejection fraction or pumping function of the heart, and still having obstructive sleep apnea still remained positively associated with having this dysfunction. 
So that's here. Oh, is it positive? So I'm just on time. So in summary, I think it's important to know that we know that air pollution is a cofactor for heart disease. Now, I think exposure to 9-11 being in the cloud may be considered a cofactor, right? So it may be something that could be impacting cardiovascular risk through several different channels. One is the group that has PTSD. One is the group that has sleep apnea. Um, and, you know, we can see the stiffening of the heart. So I think that continued follow-up of this cohort and also extending to some of the other groups the, um, to look at echocardiograms and some of the other um, people that were not looked at here, to compare with the control population. When we wrote one of our first grants, they said, oh, you don't need a control population, one of the reviewers said. And, and subsequently, all of us as researchers are trying to find adequately controlled populations. So what I had, what I had proposed was to look at groups of um, police officers in either Philadelphia other, or um, in New Jersey, Jersey City, who did not come to 9-11 to ground zero, but were affected by similar ambient temperatures, similar lifestyle, similar shift work, et cetera, and see if we can see differences in their heart risk. Um, and finally, there are other novel imaging. You know, this is we used basic echocardiograms and the different biomarkers, such as brain natriuretic peptide, which has been shown to be associated with increased um, diastolic dysfunction. So those are things that we, we hope we can do at some point. And I want to thank my team, um, especially Dr. Maceda, who's here with me this afternoon. She does all the hard work, and all of my colleagues throughout the group. Thank you very much. So uh, it's an honor, uh, truly an honor, to introduce our next speaker. Um, it says here that uh, Dr. Reibman, Dr. John Reibman, is a medical director of the NYU Bellevue Asthma Airways Environmental Program, been a member of the ACRC since its inception, and that she began the Bellevue Hospital Asthma Program in 1991. Um, you really don't have to go any further than that in the official biography because um, it's the presence uh, the mere presence of a person and a physician like Joan Reibman uh, that renders uh, Bellevue a world-class hospital and the Survivors Program world, a world-class health program. Uh, really nothing more needs to be said. Uh, she is a guiding star of our program. She is someone who you can always call uh, for help. And believe me, I have done that many times. Uh, and she's always there. Uh, and she's always there for her patients, a superb researcher. Another triple threat, folks, and the real deal. Please, Joan, please welcome her. Well, thank you. Um, I thought nothing more, need more be said because it tells you my age. But <laughs> um, uh, it's really... Um, I think it's very interesting, first of all, anyone who wants to get up and exercise for a little bit, please please do so. Uh, but it's really interesting to follow all these talks because I think what you're starting to hear is really going to be a theme amongst them all. And I'm going to actually continue that theme um, and also sort of take you a little bit on the journey that we've had in trying to understand uh, the symptoms in our population. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, detection of lung injury and inflammation in the World Trade Center survivor population. And I'd like to say that much of this uh, uh, work has been funded by CDC NIOSH, either through our uh, clinical grant, where we've done analyses of this population, uh, or clearly by uh, some of the research grants that we are extremely uh, thankful for. So let me start actually with the initial story, uh, which I think sort of uh, gives you a background for everything else, which is that after 9-11, uh, we realized that there were groups that were following the responder program and the firefighters, and that there was very little known about the local community. And so working together with the um, New York State Department of Health in a study funded by the CDC, uh, we actually did one of the first, in fact, the first study on respiratory health in a local community population. And the reason I bring this up is because it is, and I feel I bolded it, one of the few studies that we've had uh, that actually compares a exposed population with an appropriate control population. And we actually went and did these surveys uh, door to door, uh, building to building, 
uh, in an affected uh, geographic site, but also in the Upper West Side, which we chose because we thought they might respond more. Uh, and that study was designed and implemented and completed uh, within 16 months after 9-11. Uh, and we actually oversampled the um, exposed population because we actually predated many of the other studies. And to make a, a, a story very short, I just want to say clearly that we identified many, many symptoms or increased new onset symptoms in the exposed residential population compared to the um, unexposed population. And we published this, uh, and it also showed that we had objective findings uh, and also a dose response. These findings were then uh, replicated or uh, expanded upon and shown in different populations by, I only cite two, but many uh, other studies that were done by the World Trade Center Health Registry, uh, confirming again the increase in symptoms in this population. The uh, additional studies went on, uh, one by the New York State, but also by the New York City uh, Health Registry to show that, in fact, many of these symptoms were associated with both acute and chronic exposures that I showed you uh, representations of earlier. The interesting thing was that many of these patients in our study, for example, as we did lung function, uh, in fact, most of them had normal lung function. And interestingly, if you go and you look at David's data, uh, he has the beautiful ability to show you longitudinal lung function. But if you look at a point in time, most of those individuals actually have normal lung function. And so, in fact, many people doubted, in fact, that our patients had symptoms, and they would call it reported symptoms. I thought symptoms were reported, but these were reported symptoms or reportedly reported symptoms. And, in fact, there was a big question about whether these symptoms were, in fact, real. Early on, uh, right actually within two weeks of 9-11, uh, we had a firefighter who was admitted to uh, Bellevue Hospital, and uh, he was actually in the intensive care unit. He was quite uh, sick. And uh, he had, in fact, a CAT scan here that was very abnormal, with a whiteness there that's reflective of abnormalities. But we had a very, very aggressive divisional chief at that point who really believed that everybody who walked in the door should be bronchoscoped. Uh, and so <laughs> this gentleman uh, was bronchoscoped. And that was very revealing because what it showed us was two things. One, he had a lot of inflammatory cells uh, that are eosinophils. Those are these pink cells here uh, in his lung. And you're going to hear and you've heard about inflammation all along. You heard from David this question of eosinophils. And this gentleman, in fact, had a lot of eosinophils uh, in his bronchoalveolar lavage fluid consist consistent with an extensive eosinophilic inflammatory process. The other thing that uh, was shown by this bronchoscopy was that the sample was sent for mineralogic analysis. Uh, and what you could see was that, in fact, these, uh, there were particles of asbestos that were found. There were fly ash particles. There were degraded fibrous glass particles. So a lot of different types of particles. But the point was that, in fact, these were very, very, very large particles that were being washed out from the very small areas of this gentleman's lung. So it showed us two things. One, that you could, in fact, get an acute eosinophilic inflammatory uh, response in the lung. And two, despite the dogma that we'd all learned as pulmonologists, that these large particles don't get in the lung, in fact, that many of these patients could have had the potential to have overwhelmed the normal defense mechanisms of the lung. And these particles were, in fact, deep in the lung. We subsequently went on, uh, and uh, Carol Lee, who uh, is covering my asthma clinic today, uh, uh, it, um, published this, uh, a pathologic study in a number of patients, a small number of patients, because most people don't really feel like having their lungs biopsy, but uh, a small number of patients who uh, we looked at either because they had interstitial lung disease or because they had a lot of symptoms and very abnormal lung function, uh, who for a variety of reasons had undergone uh, lung biopsy. And here's one which again shows us something very interesting. This uh, person had a normal CAT scan, although showed some evidence of air trapping, uh, which David uh, talked about and um, Raphael de la Hose has published in many of these people. 
But what was interesting in the biopsy was that, first of all, if you looked at the biopsy, there was a lot of destruction of the lung itself. This looks, in a way, like emphysema. But the lung function abnormalities were not similar to emphysema. So there was something funny going on in this lung. The other thing one can see is that there were some small particles, and they sort of uh, uh, light up here in a way. And if you looked at these particles, they had a lot of unusual material, silica, aluminum, uh, a lot of metal, steel, copper, chromium. So they were weird particles that are suggestive, certainly not diagnostic, but suggestive that they might be World Trade Center-related materials. But the point is, really, that there's a weird destruction uh, in the smaller parts of the lung, in the parenchyma, basically, and that there are small particles deep in the lung many, many years after 9-11. So this suggested to us that, in fact, we might be looking in the wrong place when we're looking for lung function abnormalities, that we're all busy doing spirometry, and we get a number of measurements from that, forced expiratory volume in one second, which tells us the speed with which you can blow out air, forced vital capacity, which tells you how much air you could blow out. But spirometry measures only various components of uh, airflow, and actually misses a lot of the abnormalities you might be finding in the small airways. And so we were working with Ken Berger and Roberta Goldring, uh, and they uh, suggested that, that perhaps we were actually missing a lot of the lung injury by just looking at spirometry. And so we set out very early and routinely uh, looked at um, different components. So here, for example, this is uh, showing you that most patients in our World Trade Center program, and you'll see that in the responder program, and you'll see that in the firefighter program, that if you look at spirometry and you group this as normal spirometry, obstructed, low vital capacity, that in fact most, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, have normal spirometry. Here's the symptomatic cohort. This is for a longitudinal study we were doing, but this is a symptomatic cohort showing you that 73% had normal spirometry. And if we're going to see an abnormality, the abnormality we see is not that they're obstructed, which is classic for asthma, but what you see is, in fact, a slight reduction in forced vital capacity, which tells you that there's something else going on in this population. So uh, we then had lots and lots of arguments with our physiology group. We said, what, what studies can we be doing? What can we do, be doing in these larger populations? Should we be doing methicoline challenge in everyone? Well, our population wasn't going to go for that. And so very, very early on, we, we routinely put in place uh, the use of something called forced oscillation using what's called impulse oscillometry as a technique. And this is non-invasive. It's a simple maneuver. You do it at tidal breathing, that is, at rest. And it measures resistance directly by measuring the relationship between pressure and flow at different oscillating frequencies by sound waves applied externally. And I've been doing this for years, and if you think I understand this, you got another thing coming. <laughs> anyway, there's a number of components you can measure, and they tell you different things, such as R5, which is a resistance at 5 hertz, and R5 minus 20, which is perhaps a measure of small airway resistance. And these are not clean maneuvers. You have to take into account as you do them, uh, BMI. There's other things that can uh, uh, affect these measures. Uh, but we began doing them very early on in all our patient population. And we did it in our whole clinical population. And in fact, almost everyone had abnormal oscillometry measures. And we said, this is really sort of confusing because this means everybody's sick. Is this correct? And so luckily, we were able to work with the Department of Health uh, and do a, a, an additional study where we could look at a control group. And here we did a collaboration with the World Trade Center Department of Health Registry in a case control study where we went again into the field and looked at patients who had persistent respiratory symptoms and exposure compared to patients who did not have respiratory symptoms. And what we were able to show uh, we asked the question whether there were lung function, both spirometry and impulse oscillometry differences between symptomatic cases and control. And we hope that these studies can go on uh, and help us understand large populations in the future. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you very much. 
Uh, if you go to the AGM website, it's all open access. You'll see a 9-11 link. You just go to that link. Uh, you don't have to go through PubMed to get the open access. You can get it directly from our website. Uh, so that's a good thing. And, um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, some article, we, we received more than 13. Some did not make it through the process. And, and uh, I want to say up front that uh, uh, a manuscript that I was a co-author on was rejected. So um, lest, lest, you think, <laughs> lest you think that uh, there's something unfair about the process, trust me, there, there, there is, it's not an unfair process. And, and, there, and there's my proof. Actually, um, I, I, ha I had to show this because uh, my research assistant at uh, Queens did such a nice job uh, 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 illustrating really the, the 13 studies and sort of how they cluster in terms of particular disease, uh, asthma obviously the most common in terms of attention, but also some. Um, we uh, had an article uh, by FDNY, uh, Yip, uh, Zig Owens, and others. Uh, it, which was an overview of their program, and I think a very useful uh, article because it, it gives you kind of a summary look at the impact the uh, World Trade Center on uh, firefighters and EMS personnel, and also a summary of their program. So that, that I think, most of the articles we see in the literature are really focused on particular research questions. This is more of an overview, and I think uh, helpful. And then there's an article by you uh, on economic loss. Uh, this is uh, out of... Um, the FDNY, uh, also looking at early uh, retirement, not FDNY, I'm sorry, uh, this is the World Trade Center Health Registry, thank you, thank you for all that you do, <laughs> including correcting me. Um, uh, looking at uh, early retirement and disability and, and the economic consequence of that, which is a relatively neglected but very uh, important topic. And then uh, others, some of these studies actually have been shown today, um, and I'm not going to uh, walk you through all of these, uh, except to say we have a couple of uh, cancer studies. One, uh, this one from the, uh, the Health Registry, uh, updating their uh, cancer uh, study. Uh, another one from FDNY. This one, this one's interesting because it compares the FDNY, the firefighter experience, to other firefighters from other urban cities in the U.S. So it kind of removes the issue of do non-World Trade Center firefighter exposures, are they responsible for uh, some of the cancer outcomes that are seen? And so that's, that was an interesting um, thing that they, that they did. Um, and uh, something on mental health of tower survivors that came out of the, uh, the uh, registry, uh, the issue of metabolic syndrome that Marianne spoke about before. And I think actually this raises a challenge for the program as to how far we get into non-World Trade Center issues and, how far we serve people in terms of uh, addressing their general health concerns. Um, and uh, this is the summary article on FDNY that I mentioned before, uh, looking at the relationship between BMI and GERD uh, out of uh, the Sinai group and the consortium, and then a couple of articles that, uh, on uh, respiratory disease among survivors that Joan uh, 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 um, summarized before. Um, and so, I want to just close by making one uh, editorial comment. Um, and that is that uh, it's strange to say that words matter in, in uh, the, the library in New York City, New York State, a medical library, or for that matter, speaking to an academic or research community. But this is the time of year when the occupational health researchers who otherwise toil in absolute obscurity, uh, the media never contact us, uh, this is the time of year when media journal journalists and the like find us and what they want to talk about results, and they, they need to talk about it. They need to discuss that because there's public interest. And some journalists get it right, and some journalists don't quite get it right, and, and in fairness, some of this stuff is nuanced, and so it, it, it isn't so easy necessarily to get it right, but it's our responsibility, uh, uh, quite apart from what journalists say, it's our responsibility to get it right, to, you, to select the right words to frame what we find correctly. And we have tried hard in our journal to make sure that any conclusions, any discussion were based on the findings within the study. There have been uh, from uh, other, some other authors some statements made in public, which I think are hyperbole or exaggerations or are excessively uh, loose with the findings. And I, it's a disservice. And, and I, I suspect I'm preaching to the choir here. 
uh, but it's a disservice because, uh, you know, the World Trade Center population, a certain proportion are, are fearful of what's going to happen to them, and appropriately fearful, and may, maybe even more fearful because we've reached the 15-year latency in terms of maybe uh, cancer increasing in the future. And to reinforce, to play on, to stoke those fears is really a disservice. And I think that it takes a lot of integrity and compassion to get it right. And I think that um, for the most part, we're doing that. And I, I thank you for that. One last thing, these photos you've been looking at during the break, those are my son's photos that appeared in Newsweek. And even better is a video that he produced with others, a seven minute video, which is accessible on Atlantic Monthly. 9-11, just Google 9-11 uh, Atlantic Monthly. It's gotten a, a 100,000 views so far. A really interesting profile of a couple of responders, a one ill, one not ill, and how they feel about their treatment and how they feel about how people view them now. So I recommend you take a look. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. And I hope all of you had a chance to see those photos. Um, they were on rotation during break, and they were quite powerful. So thank you for that. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Emanuel Teoli. Um, is the press professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy and Department of Thoracic Surgery and director of the Institute for Translational Epidemiology. Dr. Teoli joined the institution on May 2015 was formerly the professor and director for research and popula population health at Hofstra North Shore School of Medicine and chief of epidemiology for the North Shore LIJ, LIJ Health System. Prior to joining LIJ, Dr. Taoli was the Arnold Palmer Professor of Cancer Prevention at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Taoli's education includes an MD from the University of Milan, a residency in cardiology, and a PhD in epidemiology from Columbia University. She practiced as a cardiologist for several years before becoming a full-time scientist. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Taoli, and she's gonna present biomarkers and the prostate cancer increase in the World Trade Center cohorts. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming. Um, let me get oriented. Okay, so you sit full sh shape. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the study that we almost concluded on prostate cancer in the World Trade Center cohort. And I give you a little bit of background of why we got here. Uh, if I can move this. Okay. Um, so uh, the idea came out from two sources. One was the um, cohort studies that were going on that were showing an increase in risk of prostate cancer. Um, and uh, another was more anecdotal because the urologists were telling us that the prostate cancer they were finding seemed more aggressive in younger people. So there were information around. Um, and some of the hypotheses would be that uh, um, there was an artifact because of increased surveillance, because these people are seen very often because of they're part of a cohort, or that really there was an increase in prostate cancer. Um, so uh, as you see, um, these are the data that were published in the meantime, and these are the three cohorts that we have heard about this morning. And the part in red is the increased risk in prostate cancer in all three. And at least for the Sinai cohort, the early cases were taken uh, out of the calculation, the cases that were diagnosed, uh, diagnosed right after um, the disaster. Uh, so uh, we went through uh, a whole process that included a, an epi study and a molecular study, and I'll show you a little bit of both. Uh, so we want to understand the increased incidence in prostate cancer and try to understand whether the cancer was more aggressive. 
I'll give you a little bit before the, 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 go, the process, I'll give you a little bit of the final is that I, I don't think we're there with an answer completely on the aggressiveness, but you, you'll decide by yourself. So with the, the first aim of the project was to understand whether there was an overdiagnosed diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer because of the increased screening or, um, or whether it was really an, an increased number of cancers. So we decided to compare the prostate cancer that were coming from the Mount Sinai uh, program uh, with a group of non-World Trade Center prostate cancer to see, and with registry data, to see whether they were similar in age of diagnosis stages and, and uh, aggressiveness measured by the Gleason score. Uh, and then we wanted to look at the markers of inflammation within the tissue, um, try to understand whether there was a process of inflammation that was more than the non-World Trade Center prostate cancer, and that was a responsible for an increase in, in diagnosis because the cancer uh, developed more rapidly or maybe more aggressively. And, um, and the third aim was to look at global DNA methylation, um, both because there are, there are studies showing that the decrease in methylation is a sign of aggressiveness. And the second reason is we hoped to see hotspot of methylation that could correspond to very specific carcinogen exposure and maybe be able to identify what had reached the prostate um, in, this, in this man. So the, uh, the study population came from uh, the clinics uh, at Mount Sinai. Uh, there were 442 self-reported, but then we only selected the confirmed cases that went through the cancer registry or the medical records. Um, these are past the six months from the accident, and uh, uh, we also eliminated all the prostate cancer cases that came in later in the cohort once they were diagnosed. So this is the original cohort followed over time. I uh, hope this one, okay. This is anyway, it's not, it's just a general characteristic of the population, so it's not extremely important. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that we try to uh, distinguish the uh, level of exposure uh, by using the exposure matrix that have been developed over the years, uh, which are basically uh, built on where they, the, the person was at the time of the uh, event and in terms of working and for how many days work there. So it's a very, um, not, not very precise measure of exposure. Anyway, that's what is available. Uh, so the first thing that we did, we, we calculated uh, using the New York State Cancer Registry, the age-specific age specific, um, rates ratios. So now the first thing is on the bottom, if you look at the red uh, line, so that's the new uh, adjusted age-adjusted standardized ratio, uh, which is updated with more cases than the one was published that I show you in one of the first slides. So it still holds, there is still an increase in uh, um, uh, the risk in, in versus the expected is 165 with confidence intervals are way above above one. Then if you look at the age specific, uh, age specific uh, risk rates that are calculated over the New York State Registry, they are all a little bit higher, but what's really high is below age 49, which is the first, the first one here, and uh, the very old ages, which is down there. So um, the very old ages, um, I don't really uh, know how much we can explain because we don't have a lot of people in that age group because of the fact that this was a young cohort 15 years ago. So it's very few people are down there. Um, the young ages, um, we were discussing, the idea was they do more uh, screening for prostate cancer, for PSA. In reality, below the age of 50, the screening is not recommended. So these people should have not been sent to screening more often because anyway, they're below the age in which screening is recommended. So this group of people is the interesting one because it looks like they are younger and there is an increase in risk of prostate cancer. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, okay, so we try then, so we had some index of, uh, of aggressiveness, which were the Gleason score, the stage, 
and then the micro risk uh, classification, which is made out of the PSA, the Gleason score, and the stage. And then we try to look at this across exposure levels, uh, duration of, of work in, in the area, and uh, whether they worked on, on the pile of debris or not. And uh, the element, and we were trying to look at the dose response, whether um, with the increasing exposure, there was an increase in uh, uh, aggressive cases, basically. And the only um, factor that was associated with uh, increasing exposure was the clinical stage, which you see is 1, 2.5. 2.43 and 5.58. So this is the only element. Now, um, this analysis was a little bit uh, uh, controversy because we have a lot of missing data in both in the cancer registry and in uh, the World Trade Center cancer registry. But that's the, uh, the data we have. Uh, now, we wanted also to, uh, to see whether uh, these people were um, doing, were, were um, diagnosed because of symptoms and uh, whether they had more PSA testing than the general population. And this I'm in the middle of this, so I don't have complete results. But if you look at the National Health Survey, 28% uh, of uh, uh, U.S. Ma uh, males uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer have symptoms, and we find 25%. So it doesn't look like they had what the urologist was telling us. Uh, it's not really um, represented in the data. They don't seem to come up to the diagnosis because they have more symptoms. Uh, we're now looking at the PSA testing, but I don't have the data yet from uh, the uh, National Health Survey. 63% uh, of the cases had at least one PSA testing in the World Trade Center cohort. Uh, in terms of a high level of, of a PSA, it looks like uh, they are very similar to the enhanced cohort. So it doesn't look like the clinical aggressiveness is very different from what expected in the general population. So just to close this first part that I presented, it looks like the rates are still higher. Uh, patients below 50, 49, 50 are the one that seems to be more represented in this cohort. And there seems to be a connection with uh, um, aggressiveness and the exposure level that we have to explore more in detail. Now going to the second part, which was the one looking at the inflammation markers. So we ran this nanostring immunoprofile, which is basically the RNA expression of a panel of 700 and past genes. Uh, and we did this, right, the first, the first site is 15 World Trade Center prostate cancer tissues and 15 non-prostate cancer tissues. We will have a second round, but this is the beginning of, of the study, the first set that we did. We matched them on age, race, and, race and the Gleason score to make them as as uh, similar as possible. And uh, I think I'm, I'm finished. And if you have a question, thank you. So it's um, my pleasure to introduce uh, the director of uh, our division of the occupational medicine here at um, Mount Sinai, Dr. Roberto Lucchini. He's been so since 2012. Um, he's been also the director of the World Trade Center Data Center and Director of NIOSH Education and Research Center of New York and New Jersey. He is also an Associate Professor at the University of Brescia, Italy, in the Division of Occupational Medicine. His research is focused on the health effects of neurotoxic chemicals and the biological mechanisms by which metals, pesticides, solvents, persistent organic pollutants, particulate matter in the environment, and workplace cause injury in the human nervous system. Dr. Lucchini and his team have developed quantitative, state-of-the-art testing methodologies and advanced computerized instruments to assess an array of neurologic functions, including cognitive, motor, behavioral, and sensory functions. He and his team have conducted studies in occupational groups, children, and elderly from, with, with funding from the Italian National Fund, the European Union, and NIEHS. Dr. Lucchini serves as a principal investigator on a multi-institutional research project supported by an RO1 grant from NIEHS that is examining neurological function in adolescents exposed to ambient manganese, and a case control study on genetic and environmental determinants 
of Parkinson, Parkinson's in the province of Brescia, Italy. This investigation is an international consortium that includes the University of Brescia, University of California at Santa Cruz, Harvard School of Public Health, Columbia, and Rutgers University. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lucchini. Thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for inviting me. And uh, this presentation is a little bit different from, uh, from the other ones because it's actually talking about international collaboration. Uh, this is a, a comparison of the World Trade Center health program with uh, other programs related to uh, the major international uh, accident disasters that happen. Uh, and uh, how do I? Sorry, sorry, sorry. This one? <laughs> Sorry. So uh, basically, here they are. Uh, this is um, Seveso, Bhopal, Chernobyl, Water Center, and Fukushima. So the idea of this came uh, about a year ago when uh, actually I had a conversation with, uh, with, uh, with the other colleagues who actually run these programs still today. And uh, especially with the Russian uh, and the Japanese, because uh, at that time, the World Trade Center Health Program, one year ago, there was the discussion about having the program, re the renewal of this program. And so uh, the same problem was for the Russians and the Japanese. So we were all together thinking, oh, this is, these are all important programs and uh, what's going to happen? Uh, there's a, there are problems in being funded, and so we had this idea of uh, writing together some sort of white paper uh, where we wanted to analyze these different accidents, trying to have a systematic analysis of what happened and come up with indication of the importance of these programs and also for emergency preparedness. So this is the reason why uh, and uh, we, we did this work, and actually there's now a paper that is being reviewed, and the idea is actually to try to give some uh, follow-up to this paper when, when it will be published with some public initiative, hopefully, and keeping together this network. This is a network of colleagues, and it's very interesting because the methodology for this was actually, uh, this is a timeline, and, and the timeline is actually interesting. I was actually thinking about it. So he used Cervezo 1976. Uh, Three Mile Island, also in the U.S., 1979, Bhopal, 1984, and Chernobyl, 1986. So I thought in 10 years, there were four, actually, major industrial accidents. And, and after those, those first four, I think that there was a lot of uh, probably regulation and, uh, and uh, prevention, and uh, definitely in Europe, because... Uh, the Cervezo accident, uh, after the Cervezo accident, there was a Cervezo directive in the 80s that was strictly regulating a lot of, a lot of safety in, 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 the, in, in, in the workplace. So actually, after these four accidents, I think that uh, the industrial, the, we didn't have major industrial accidents like those four. We had 9-11 as a terror, terroristic attack, and then Fukushima as a natural. That also, of course, the, the, the tsunami went to caused also the, 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 the nuclear accident, but it was originally a natural accident. So this is a timeline, and it's interesting to try to put them together and try to understand what, what happened and what's happening. And, and of course, to trying to predict what, and, and be ready for the future, try not to have more accidents like these. Uh, so what we did was a comparative assessment in, in two ways, basically. We did a PubMed literature search using the term of the accident, Cervezo or Water Center or Bhopal, then disaster epidemiology, disaster exposure assessment, emergency preparedness, these keywords. So we use that as a, as a literature search and we analyze uh, all the material. But then we also had uh, not only the, the comparative assessment using those sources, we had the the co-authors of the paper, and all of them were actually uh, experts on their own program. So I, I spent a lot of time actually with some of them through interesting stories uh, telling me about the Cervezo experience and, and the Bhopal. So it was pretty interesting to collect all the information. So I tried to have the information divided into these categories here, so which are 
probably important to, to be considered for each one of these disasters. Exposure assessment, number one. Exposed populations who were on site, workers responders versus, or whatever, in, in, in the two groups, resident survivors. And, and of course, the, the terminology is important. We talked about, so we, we use survivors so for the Water Central Health Program, other programs use residents, but the concept is the same uh, more, most of the time. Workers responders, differences, but same concept. Then the third is health surveillance program, epidemiological health surveillance program. Then the research, and then the physical and mental health effect that were uh, observed doing research and doing uh, health surveillance and epidemiological health surveillance. Then treatment and benefits, and then outreach activities. So considering these parameters, we try to understand what happened in each one of these programs and then and, and try to, to, to derive some indications and lessons. So we went through each one of them. There's a, there's a lot of extensive literature, but just to give you some, some, some brief uh, summary of them. So, so that was Seveso in 1976 in Italy, in the northern Italy, where uh, TCP uh, is an intermediate to produce a disinfectant, has a chlorophyll, and during the process there was a, a problem. And uh, it was the first time I understand that the term toxic cloud was used at that time, in the, in the 70s. And uh, so there was, di there was dioxin. And a lot of knowledge, actually, that we have today about dioxin came from that experience because nobody really know about the toxicity before that. And so here's the number, 37,000 residents, workers in the community, the health effects, chloracne, you, you, you've seen that skin, uh, that, that lesion on the face of the children. It was actually an acute effect. Endocrine disruptor stories about the, 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 the uh, substantial literature about endocrine disruptor and the effect on uh, reproductive toxicity came from dioxin, and that experience is very interesting. Cardiovascular disease and cancer. How surveillance there was done, 1976, 1984, then, it was, then, then we, we ran out of funds. Uh, but it continues, it's continued today with ongoing uh, follow-up research. This is a very interesting story here, and I find this different from the other programs. Uh, there was a doctor there, and I, that was just a person, he's dying in his 80s. He's a very, very interesting person, and I, Paolo, 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 sorry, I don't remember the name. Uh, so I spent a lot of time talking to him, and one of the, the, the best things he did is I, it was actually, I think, that he collected the, the samples from these people. In, in one of the first days, I remember it was the second or third day, but he immediately had this concept of collecting samples. And he collected, I think, 3,500. Those samples were precious. At that time, I understand he told me that nobody knew how to measure uh, dioxin on, on serums. And, but they, collect, they kept the, the, the samples until in the 80s, I think, CDC developed the, 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 the analytical method. And so the method was available, and they were able finally to measure and find what the exposure was a few days after the accident. So it was an interesting concept of, again, trying to uh, have the idea of immediately collapsed sample, biological, environmental measurement, uh, and a very important concept nowadays as a lesson from all these programs. But, but that, I think that, that that example was quite interesting. And the research, there's, there's ongoing research actually using those data and the follow-up of the cohort, of course, uh, is using the data uh, that we measure uh, from those samples. So it's very, very, very important, even so many years later. Um, as I said, a directive, uh, a regulation that came out to, for Europe to, to, as, a, as a very important point for that, 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 that is an outcome of the experience. And then uh, Bhopal, of course, methyl isocyanate in the pesticide plant of Union Carbide. It was a miserable experience, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, death and, uh, and the cloud of methyl isocyanate gas. 500,000, the numbers here are not very, very accurate, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, workers and community, death, absor ab abortion, neonatal mortality, COPD, keratopathy cancer, no health surveillance, unfortunately. Uh, but now the colleague who's actually now working, uh, still working on this, is hopefully going to be able to restore the follow-up on 15,000 on 15, of those uh, subjects. Uh, Chernobyl uh, ionizing radiation, and uh, that was actually a, a, a kind of a historical important point where uh, the plant there in uh, Pripyat was actually the name of the, of the place close to Chernobyl uh, released uh, radiation uh, 
in a, in a, in a very large area. So 600,000 responders, 5 million community, death, cardiovascular, leukemia, thyroid cancer is out, is out outcome. How surveillance is still ongoing on 600,000, they call them liquidators, the responders, uh, including workers, uh, I think soldiers too, uh, who were on site, I'm looking at Evelyn, you, you know much better than me these this issues. Uh, I think that there, there's, a, there's a large number in their data center. They have a data center in Moscow still today, and they are dealing with 600,000, uh, so it's pretty complex. And so the, the whole program there includes uh, CCEs in different countries, like Russia, Ukraine, and, and Belarus. And it's interesting to see, uh, it's not the ideal political relations between Russia and Ukraine, but, but the network is very good. The colleagues are working together be, because they really uh, have the, the, this feeling that they need to work together uh, for, for the responders. Uh, we also collected the number of publication. Uh, so there's an average of 40 publication, 29 years for Chernobyl. Uh, Water Center, we all know about the Water Center, and I don't need to repeat all, all this data. Actually, you take, uh, uh, there's almost 1,000 publications in 14 years, average of 65 per year. Uh, and then Fukushima, uh, the most recent one, uh, Fukushima with uh, ionizing radiation again. 20,000 20, responders, 200,000 200, uh, 200, uh, in the community. Uh, no recognized increased cancer rate still today, but mental health in, uh, in Fukushima. And mental health is pretty common to all these programs, except for Cervezo, but honestly, I talked to the doctor there and he, they, they really never uh, try to understand the mental health uh, impact of Cervezo, which is something, this is interesting in a way, but mental health impact is common to all these programs, uh, uh, as a matter of fact. There's a follow-up of 20,000, uh, and uh, six, a lot of publications in these four years is, is the highest uh, average per year, 150 for Fukushima. Uh, so, conclusion of this uh, uh, initiative is that uh, comparing all these programs, uh, exposure was assessed to some certain extent in Cervezo, as I said, with the biomarkers, basically, and, and a, a lot of measurement for, in Chernobyl and Fukushima for the radiation, but uh, no, no one uh, really benefited from a timely or systematic strategy in exposure assessment, which is basically a, a very important and crucial out, outcome uh, uh, when you compare all these programs and you understand that uh, exposure assessment, timely exposure assessment, systematic exposure assessment is uh, absolutely a, 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 an important point. All in Cervezo was the number of exposed individuals known with reasonable certainty, so who, who was on site, it's very, very important. You need exposure assessment, you need to know who's on site and have and track each, each person who's on site, don't have other person that are, are not supposed to be there without proper training. Uh, and this is actually uh, interesting. Uh, I, I was in contact with the NOCMED doctor from Brussels when uh, they had the, the terrorist attack in the subway and in uh, the airport. And, uh, and um, so also in that case, uh, they were pretty good in, uh, in sort of uh, using this recommendation, I understand. Uh, they limited, they tracked everybody on site very well. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether they did some uh, exposure assessment over there, but definitely they had a very good uh, systematic approach with uh, the responders because they understand that it's highly important to have them uh, tracked and with badges, with, with re individual recognition of each one of them. Um, so programs on health surveillance, treatment and follow-up, implementing the, implemented at, at Cervezo definitely, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and World Trade Center health program, as, you, as we all know. Uh, this program generally focuses more on the workers and the responders and to a lesser extent on the residents and survivors. This is common to, the, to, the, to all programs. Uh, the programs found exposure-related physical and mental health consequences and uh, identified the need for long-term health care of the affected population, definitely. And uh, active outreach and benefit programs figure prominently, almost exclusively, for the World Center Health Program, which is the, the most advanced, definitely, health surveillance program that was ever implemented with uh, all these uh, important uh, outreach also and benefits and so articulated uh, aspects. 
So final recommendation, as I already said, uh, persistence of chronic effects on physical and mental health and quality of life of, after so many years, think about Cervezo and in Chernobyl. I mean, that's, that's a very important knowledge that we have. And the long latency period for solid tumors, I like the need for lifetime disaster-related health programs. Systematic and timely exposure assessment, identification of exposed population are key elements of air surveillance and, 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 uh, and disaster responders. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to keep you posted on, with the next uh, development of this initiative. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Robert Brackbill. Dr. Robert Brackbill is currently the Director of Research for the World Trade Center Health Registry that's located in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He was the founding PI for the registry and has been involved in conducting research on health issues related to the 9-11 disaster since its inception. Thank you, Dr. Brackbill, for being here today, and we look forward to hearing your uh, talk about qualitative analysis of 9-11 injury. Thank you so much, and let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Brackbill. I think Michael Crane asked for two sentences for a bio, so, you know, I complied. So, <laughs> so, so my uh, presentation is on a qualitative analysis of 9-11 injury, and uh, this is actually a study that uh, we did actually completed recently this past June um, where we uh, interviewed people by telephone uh, to get more information about what happened, what circumstances around uh, their injury on 9-11. Um, <clears throat> I have to give mention to the person who is my project manager for this study, Lisa Gargano. Uh, Dr. Lisa Gargano is in the registry in my unit, and uh, she sort of managed the process, worked with um, Dr. Gershon, who did the interviews, and we have a paper now. It's act actually out, currently out in review, um, you know, hoping soon to hear about its uh, eventual, you know, emergence. Um, so just to... Before I begin, I guess I go on here. So what do I hit to go forward? Ah, this, this work? Okay, good. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, World Trade Center Health Registry. Um, I think it's been mentioned here several times, but uh, normally in a presentation, we give a little bit of a summary of what the registry is. Um, well, the World Trade Center Health Registry is a follow-up study of a 9-11 disaster. Um, the enrollment for the registry was from 2003 to 2004. We have uh, 71,000 people in the cohort. We have uh, continued to follow this cohort uh, for the last, um, you know, 14 years um, since enrollment. Um, and we've had, you know, three follow-up surveys. We just completed the most recent one, um, the fourth or the third actually follow-up in 2016. That is most, you know, just the... Uh, you know, earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> and there are four, four groups in the registry. Uh, we refer to them as eligibility groups. And I think this, this session is primarily focused on rescue recovery workers and cleanup workers. Uh, the registry has um, about 30,000, we estimate about 30,000 rescue recovery workers who worked at the WTC site, um, you know, between, you know, September 11th, uh, 2001 to June 30th. Uh, 2002, but we also have people who are residents uh, on 9-11 south of uh, Chambers, uh, south of uh, Canal Street, and we have people who were on the street or in buildings, uh, in the towers and surrounding damaged buildings, other buildings are on the street, uh, south of Chambers Street, um, and then also um, uh, stu students and uh, teachers and staff in schools who actually worked, either enrolled or, or were staff in schools in South of Canal Street. So the registry actually has a very diverse population, and we can look at um, non-rescue recovery workers, you know, community members, people who work in the area, et cetera. So 
uh, injuries actually were fairly highly prevalent on um, nine, you know, as reported to fight it to the registry. Um, we had a, one question in our initial uh, survey, baseline survey, enrollment survey, where we asked people, uh, were you injured, you know, on 9-11, on did you sustain an injury? And then there were uh, several categories of injuries that um, we asked people about, you know, certain burns, head injuries, um, lacerations, sprain, strain, um, head injury, et cetera, and then other injuries. And eye injury actually was the one that was most commonly reported, but uh, there were a substantial number of people who reported, you know, relatively serious injuries. Um, and we didn't go on and ask any more information beyond that question. Uh, injury just was not something that was considered to be, uh, you know, a major issue. Um, you know, if you recall, I don't know if you're here on September uh, 11th and in that, you know, at the time of the, of, uh, of the disaster, uh, there was a call for people to go to the hospitals to give blood, you know, because they thought there'd be a lot of people injured. And actually, it turned out there wasn't a need for, for blood. Uh, you know, it, you know, this was an injury was not, you know, something that was the focus. People died in the event, but, uh, but there were people who were injured. Um, and uh, many, you know, so these people did report this on, you know, in our enrollment. And we've looked, we've actually have used injury as a predictor um, in most of the studies we've done um, in, the, in the years since, uh, you know, we collected the data. And we find that, you know, people who say that they're injured on 9-11, uh, that's it is a major, that is a risk factor for post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's also been a risk factor for uh, physical health as well, uh, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. Um, this morning, I <clears throat> actually, we reviewed a presentation we'll be giving in the Grand Rounds in a few weeks. And uh, there was a, actually a, a study that was done looking at um, more, <clears throat> causes of death, mortality, a mortality study, looking at people who died as a result of uh, alcohol and, and, uh, and, and uh, overdose of, uh, you know, pre non-prescription or prescription drugs. And uh, it, you know, injury, actually, people who reported an injury in 9-11 was actually the one and only risk factor that was associated with dying from uh, the substance abuse, um, you know. So that's, that is a fairly prominent thing. It has not been looked at. So this kind of, this, this uh, injury, you know, sort of turning out to be important, regardless where you're thinking of the physical effects of injury or whether that represents a trauma, a really uh, a high level of trauma in 9-11, um, was something I thought we should look into a little bit more. And uh, we, we did then design a study that was going to be done in basically two phases. Uh, the first phase is the, the qualitative study I'll be talking about today, uh, where we um, <clears throat> called people and uh, did, a, did an interview, a uh, semi-structured interview, and uh, you know, got more information about the uh, circumstances, injury, and what happened to them, what's, what's going on with them now. And then there's going to be a second phase, which we're planning on getting into the field in January, where we're going to do a, a survey of such, and we're going to ask more in-depth questions using some scales to measure, you know, function, you know, current functional, physical functionality, other factors, social isolations, and social support, uh, maybe some psychological factors that may you know, play a role in how a person can can recover from this, and or what is happening to them now. So, uh, sorry, oops, backwards. So anyway, I think I've given you somewhat of a, uh, a summary of the goals of the study. You know, first is the film gaps and the knowledge concerning circumstances how injuries were sustained. Um, also to determine the short and long-term mental and physical health effects. And actually, this is a qualitative study um, of just some 30-some people. And it, it is an in-depth thing where people get an opportunity to talk about it. So and we wanted to... Um, get information that would help us you know, design or more in-depth study we're gonna, that we're going to do later, we're going to actually starting now. And then to assess, obviously, the social and economic impacts of being injured, which is a big part of what's, what's going on as well. Okay. So the, the, you know, there was the eligibility criteria uh, were that people reported being injured at 9-11 in, in the enrollment survey uh, that was done um, 2000, actually, that should have been 2003, 2004. I just noticed that. It's interesting. It had to be 18 years or older on 9-11. 
And uh, we, we only interviewed people by you know, using English, lang English language because just the difficulty of trying to, we had one interviewer you know, do the inter interviews, um, so it was difficult to do it in other languages. But, and then also it had to be in US just because it was more easier to reach them you know, by phone. Um, selection uh, criteria, uh, we used a, uh, you know, we developed a protocol uh, <clears throat> that uh, in terms of like, you know, recruiting people for the qualitative in interview that we were concerned about um, having people with post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms uh, then have to recall, you know, a very traumatic event. And so we, we thought if we had, um, we started off actually with recruiting people who had no PTSD, never had symptoms of PTSD, according to our surveys uh, that we'd done prior to that. And, and then after several interviews, you know, we found that people didn't, you know, had, were able to get through the interview without, you know, getting upset or, uh, you know, causing distress. Uh, and we actually had a, dis a protocol, you know, for, to identify distress symptoms so that uh, the interviewer could then, you know, find ways to ameliorate that or stop or, or find some help, you know, for them. But um, we found that, you know, these people without PTSD didn't show you know, a significant amount of distress. And so we continued to recruit and kept adding, um, you know, people might have reported PTSD earlier and then, and then people had PTSD that were more, more current. And also we, we focused on people who had more serious injuries as far as what they reported, you know, in the enrollment interview. So the class, I just sort of mentioned injuries themselves. So, you know, the, the injuries that were asked on the um, enrollment survey uh, were those, you know, like broken bones, fractures, burns, concussion, head trauma. Um, and then also the, we had less severe injuries, you know, such as sprain or strain. And these, and then also two or more injuries was another uh, selection factor. And we found in other, in other research we've done that uh, the number of uh, types of injuries that people reported you know, if we reported a head and broken bone or a head and, and aceleration or a sprain and head, that that was an indication of how serious the injury was. It was actually uh, produced a dose response with uh, physical health, uh, you know, later on, um, that the more injury, more types of injuries they, they reported. And then also post-traumatic stress disorder is, uh, you know, is, um, <clears throat> is identified by using the uh, post-traumatic checklist uh, 17 items, I think you're most sort of familiar with it, um, and that uh, people are scored on the number of items that they uh, indicate, you know, how you know, on a scale one, you know, zero to five, none at all, or all the time, um, that we use to uh, determine where somebody has probable PTSD. So as I mentioned, the semi-structured telephone interviews, and we, <clears throat> through recruitment, we, it was by the uh, Rural Trade Center staff. One thing we remark I might say this later too is that um, we didn't know what was going to, this is another part of doing a study like this, that, you know, f you, you know 13, 14 years later after they're injured, uh, you then, you know, call, you get their name, you know, you select them out, you call them up and say, would you be willing to, uh, you know, to have us call you and talk about your experience 9-11? We didn't know how people would respond to that recruitment in, in the sense we didn't know what their cooperation rate would be or how difficult it would be to get people and we found that we'd take a list of people and we'd send them letters ahead of time, tell them we're going to be calling them, that the cooperation rate was very high. We had no difficulty in recruiting people for this study. Um, and we, we actually came to a point when we kind of ran towards, it came towards the end of our contract with our researcher doing the interviews, that we had more people than we needed, in a sense. We had to kind of figure out how to, you know, come to the close of the study. Um, and also the, the, you know, uh, as the interview, you know, as we did, you know, with a qualitative study like this, you kind of look at what kind of, uh, how, what kind of information people are giving you and uh, whether or not the probes are working and that sort of thing. And so you modify uh, the, inter the sort of the interview as you go. I mean, there's a back and forth sort of thing, uh, you know, with the with person doing the interview. Well, maybe we should ask it this way or maybe we should try to focus on these things when we uh, talk to people. And of course, you know, the interviews were uh, audio transcribed and then we got the transcripts back and that's what we'd use for our analysis. <clears throat> 
So some of the key issues we asked about, you know, what were you doing at the time of attack? Um, did you receive medical attention, you know, for your injury? What happened to you? Um, you know, in terms of when you're injured, did you walk out yourself? Did somebody help you? Did you go to an emergency room? Um, how did you feel? <clears throat> how, how do you... How do your uh, injuries affect, impact your health? And then we wanted to find out about, you know, sort of the current, you know, level of, of functionality, what's going on with them. And we sort of focused on the last month, you might say, or the most recent period of time. And was there anything that you did that, you know, that helped you recover? So we wanted to find out, you know, things that people did and found that, you know, helped them, you know, help their lives if their lives are sort of, um, you know, affected by being injured. So this was a you know, fairly uh, standard thematic analysis. We had um, both, you know, several people, you know, uh, go through the transcripts and then identify themes, um, and then they compared their, you know, results. And they coded, you know, by that fashion. First came up with themes and then coded, you know, and picked out examples of things that people said that, that fit into those different themes. And I, I talk about there's four themes that I sort of focus on in this uh, talk, you know, fun functional impairment, uh, social support, you know, sort of turned out to be, you know, a major issue. Social isolation, social support, and then the economic impact, you know, in terms of not being able to keep a, you know, main, keep a job, you know, you know, stay working, be able to go to work. And then also, I think I just mentioned earlier, the study done on, um, you know, mortality with uh, alcohol and, and, you know, and drug use, that that was, you know, self-medicating uh, was, was an issue that turned up. Self-medication for, you know, trying to help, help themselves feel better. Some of the participants that are about, actually, we ended up with 34. We had um, originally planned on doing 40, but we, we found there were, I think, four or five people that we interviewed that did not, did not actually have an injury or they had rest, they said, oh, no, I wasn't injured, I had respiratory problems. So we didn't, we didn't include them in this analysis. So, I mean, that's one thing you have in a study like this. You ask people questions and then, 14 years later, you ask them again, and then they say, no, I didn't, you know, that sort of thing. But I don't think that, you know, 34 out of 39, I don't think it's so bad. And you'd see the age is about 45 on, and older on 9-11. Uh, most people were white, you know, 73%, given that they were primarily people who worked in the towers or surrounding buildings. Fairly well educated, more educated, I think, higher percent of them were, college, you know, had a college education than others in the registry. Income was also a little higher, and about 40% were rescue recovery workers. So I think I've mentioned the fact that the way we did recruiting, that um, we, st we started off uh, trying to avoid having people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So it, it, her, it happens that 50% of the 34 had no PTSD. And then uh, the, you can see the um, uh, the distribution of injuries, more severe, you know, such as head and, and bone fractures, less severe lacerations and strains, sprain of strains, although I think people can strain their back and it can be a fairly limiting kind of injury, so it's not necessarily, you know, quite that clear. Okay, so life, <clears throat> functional impairment, um, lifestyle impacts, always no longer um, said they were able to do things they previously enjoyed doing, uh, you know, you have those list of things like working out, playing sports, you know, act, outdoor activity, gardening. They also, you know, a number of people, you know, mentioned they avoided situations, you know, such as going into the city again, Manhattan, riding subways or flying on an airplane. And some examples of what people said, uh, one person said, I'm, I'm always one to say that I would never talk about my injuries because 2,700 People would have uh, traded places with me that day, so I don't really talk about injuries, but it really did change my life, uh, especially having a two-month-old at the time. You know you want to be with them all the time and do things. So I've been a lot less active with my younger kid than I was with my, <clears throat> was with my now 20-year-old. And another person said, if I have to go into the city for a function, I'm a wreck. Uh, I, can, but it's <clears throat> I can, but it's something that I would want to do and it's not something I'd stay up all night before I know I'm going to go to the museum. That is somebody talking about going into the city. And then, and planes, especially planes flying low, I'm for sure having a panic attack. It took me seven years to get on a plane after that too. 
Uh, social isolation, lack of contact with people and in society, not wanting to be in crowds, avoided going out with friends. Actually, uh, I think it's something else we <clears throat> identified um, that we're going to look at, you know, in our in our follow-up survey is, you know, sort of this concept of uh, loneliness, and that uh, I think there are people who kind of mentioned that um, they might have might have had a lot of friends, contacts, but they felt like they couldn't talk to anybody, so they felt kind of alone, or you know, without you know someone who who they could share what was going on with them. Functional, <clears throat> we go on here. Couldn't go into a movie theater. There was too many people. Uh, what if somebody had a bomb? I didn't. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to see anybody. Uh, actually, I have to look to see why this person. No, that stopped. <laughs> I think it stopped going to going out to events, going to the theater. Uh, I am not very good at social activities. I don't particularly like them, and I don't know why that is. So I try to stay away from social events. And these are you know, these are people who said this on their 14 years later. Uh, most most discussed the importance of family as support. Other sorts of support included. And these are kind of things that sort of help people in a sense. That uh, you know their their church religion you know was important in their lives. Therapy, friends, and then of course getting out and doing volunteering. You know people mentioned. I have to say that I think the fact that I have a very good home life has been the biggest impact. I mean my wife is. She's constantly caring for me outside of our children. I'm her biggest priority. So. And so I would have to equate her support as being my biggest coping mechanism. Because if I weren't for them, I don't know what would have happened to me. And speaking of his family. Several mentioned only talking about their experience with other 9-11 survivors. That's what I just mentioned a minute ago. Uh, we all know what we all went through, and we all have a story to tell. You talk to people you, and you were with that you know, but uh, what you've been through, it's very difficult to talk to other people about it. Economic impact. I think that was something I think um, was a more of a, you know, kind of a, a concrete thing that happened to people. I mean, it was, you know, people mentioning, uh, you know, they couldn't maintain job, they're disabled, uh, they were for, you know, early retirement. We just heard about the paper that came out in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine. Um, you know, the, the company that they're in, you know, they lost their jobs, couldn't find, you know, in fact, you know, it got so bad they lost their, they lost their homes. They, some people said they couldn't, you know, they had to change, had to move into a less expensive place. Economically, I'm in a hard spot. I had to take a home equity loan on my house to make ends meet. Just the overall experience with 9-11 caused me to say that's it, enough is enough. I mean, the whole event was a severe economic impact because I was basically in a rent control apartment in Battery Park, and I had to move. So when I had to move, my rent tripled. And the self-medicating theme, several participants discussed self-medicating to help with sleeping. Theme emerged only among, theme emerged only among those with current PTSD. So PTSD seemed to be a kind of a key for that. Um, I take some NyQuil or a glass of wine. Um, so you can see that uh, <clears throat> that the role these who were injured in 9/11 continued to be impacted by our experience. This this uh, uh, you know, many years later, uh, the importance of social support and or lack of social support and how they recover and how they you know they they manage their their uh, their, their, their situation. Um, we also had insight into different types of functional impairments uh, that affect these people, and they're they're, they're considerable. Um, physical and, and mental, in the sense, you know, I think agoraphobia, I think, is something that comes to mind, you know, fear of going out into crowds, leaving your home, going, you know, leave, going to places. Of course, they're not representative of all injured, and that's why we're doing, you know, phase two, a quantitative study. Um, there, was, uh, there was definitely, as I mentioned, a strong interest in participating. That is, 83% of those, you know, that we called, you know, agreed to be interviewed. Um, include a, a range of injuries. So we, we covered, you know, in terms of our trying to find people for the qualitative study, we tried to find, you know, people with one injury or more severe injuries and also with different levels of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. So I mentioned that, you know, that you know, we've completed our analysis, so we got a paper It's you know, going to be published, hopefully. Uh, we have the next phase, the quantitative follow-up survey, which we're now, you know, developing and going to focus on these issues here. Uh, it's interesting, this, um, uh, there's a, 
I wish I could remember now. I can't remember what GRIT stands for, but GRIT is actually a, there's a questionnaire for determining, you know, sort of measuring how much perseverance a person has when they have uh, difficulties. And we're going to include that uh, in our, it, it's a measure of resilience, you might say, and then uh, sort of underlying kind of personality uh, capacity to, uh, to uh, you know, to overcome uh, difficulties. So I mentioned acknowledgement. Um, Co-author, of course, Lisa Gargano and Robin Gershon. She did the, the interviews. I think many of you may know Robin. She did uh, many of these early studies, evacuation from the towers. And then recruiters, Renato, uh, Alex, Jonathan, Felix, and a uh, person who did all the transcription. Uh, thank you. So uh, thanks very much. Um, as you may know, the uh, World Trade Center is about to uh, sort of reopen the issue of traumatic injuries and mm -hmm. people who are hurt, yeah. got hurt down there will be certifiable for various injuries. And I just, I just looked at the number of the 43% that mm -hmm. came first of yeah. the reports, uh, which I guess includes both responders and members of the right, public right. community. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is your thought on that and also on the fact of this connection to PTSD? I mean, so I get hurt. When I get hurt playing basketball or something, mm -hmm. I don't get PTSD most right. of the time, you know. But when I get hurt in the course of that event, uh, it seems that I have this mm -hmm. connection much more. So is it that most of them were sort of like running away when this happened, you know, after the dust cloud? Is there any more kind of... Uh, granular information about the injuries that that seem to be having this connection. Well, you know, that's uh, that's that's been something we tried. I mean, you look at the injury. I mean, being injured in that kind of event, in that kind of trauma, and um, I think is is a surrogate for the for the level of of how much how much trauma it is in a sense. But um, it's you know I haven't been able to you know to separate out the physical effects of the injury. You know, from the from the psychological right. trauma, he, he can't do that. But I think what what I found from this qualitative study was really interesting, just because of the nature of who we recruited. You know, um, you know, people without PTSD, because we wanted to re, you know reduce the amount of distress that occurred, that those people you know reported pro, you know functional problems too. It wasn't just having post traumatic stress disorder mm. from the injury that causes someone to have difficulty keeping a job, you know, fear of going out, all those sorts of things, that there's something else going on. And that's what we kind of want to look at into further. What is that other thing going on that, you know, is somehow associated with this injury trauma thing? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Brockville. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Evelyn Brahman. Dr. Brahman's research spans a range of psychiatric problems, including alcoholism, depression, PTSD, and schizophrenia. Her research on disaster mental health started with a groundbreaking study of the psychological impact of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant accident on mothers of young children, workers at the plant, and the psychiatric patients in the public treatment sector. More recently, she's collaborated with the Ukraine Psychiatric Association on the first psychiatric epidemiologic research on the psychological impact of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. Dr. Bromit has spearheaded the first national epidemiologic survey on mental and physical disorders in the Ukraine as part of the World Health Organization's World Mental Health Survey Consortium. She also collaborates with colleagues at Stony Brook and throughout Suffolk County on research documenting lives and treatments of people entering the mental health system with a range of psychiatric problems. Among her many accomplishments, her work has resulted in more than 200 papers, chapters, and reports, and she's co-authored two books. Please extend our welcome to Dr. Evelyn Brahman. So 
Thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you, Michael, for including me in the program. And thank you to all of you who are still here for hanging in here for the entire day. That is very impressive. <laughs> Give yourself a round, round of applause. So as I started thinking and preparing for this talk, it occurred to me that to talk about the past and future perspectives of the World Trade Center Mental Health Research Program, I actually needed to go back before the World Trade Center Research Program and sort of put it in a larger context. In, in the way that Roberto, I guess he just left? No, it was right there. In the way that Roberto um, did with his talk. So it'll be uh, a little bit reflective on what he had to say um, in terms of picking, thinking. So that's the first part of my talk. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the highlights of the first 15 years because you heard them today and you heard them presented very elegantly and in, and in great detail. But I'm going to make a couple of comments about what really wasn't looked at in the first 15 years, which is unfortunate, um, and then spend a little bit of time on my personal thoughts, which you might not share, uh, about what we ought to be thinking about for the next 15 years. So let's hope I do this right. Okay. So as you saw on Roberto's initial slides, We've had a number of horrific, toxic disasters, um, starting with the atomic bombing in World War II to Love Canal up in Buffalo, north of Buffalo, uh, Three Mile Island, which is how I sort of launched my career doing community-based research before that had strictly been on clinical populations, um, to the others that you see there, including the sarin attack on the subway in Japan, which was frightening, horrific, and absolutely horrible. And the most recent large-scale one, as Roberto said, being Fukushima. So, just to put this in a broader perspective, all of these disasters, as well as natural disasters, vary in the level of destruction that they have in their wake and, and the threat to life. All disasters have phases. There are different graphics out there that you can find for the phases of a disaster. This is the one that I like the most because it shows the short-term, medium-term, and long-term phases of the disaster. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of ambiguity in defining when one phase ends and another phase begins. That's one reason I like it. And the other reason I like it is that if you look all the way to the right, there's no end. So it's not like it comes down and it's ever over, because for many toxic disasters, it's never over. So when you read research or you read papers from monitoring programs about the health effects, you have to look at when it is the data were collected, and then think about the phases of that disaster and try and ground what you're reading about the prevalence and the current risk factors and the past risk factors in the context of where in the phases of the disaster the project was actually undertaken. So, as you've been hearing all day, toxic disasters are complex, they're enduring, and they have both physical health and mental health consequences. The mental health consequences are a lot more than just PTSD, which is what we heard a lot about today. Um, I th I think David started off by talking about depression becoming more important. I think depression may, all have, may have been important all along, but didn't receive the kind of attention that PTSD did. There's health anxiety that happens after toxic disasters. That's often the nexus for driving a lot of the health problems, because if you believe something is true, it's likely to become true. And of course, there's, there's grief and prolonged grief. Um, there are also somatic symptoms like severe headaches and substance abuse issues and substance use issues. And so this slide also includes some physical health sequelae, which of course are going to vary depending on the kind of disaster. So what's interesting is that the mental health effects of disasters seem to be pretty universal. They cut across cultures. They cut across types of disasters. The physical health effects are fairly specific to the actual toxic exposure. But I put them together on one slide, rather than spreading it out with bigger letters so you could read it better, on two slides, because mental and physical health, as you've been hearing all day, are really intimate partners. 
Another way of thinking about it is that they, they are opposite sides of the same coin. So this is my take, which is a little bit different from, from Roberto's take, and we should talk about it. So prior to the World Trade Center health surveillance programs, I'm not talking about the research, I'm talking strictly about the monitoring and health surveillance programs that happened after the World Trade Center. Um, none of the surveillance programs that were done after the disasters that took place before included mental health. So, after the bombing in Japan, the Americans set up the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, which is now called RERF. It's now run basically by the Japanese government. Uh, it focused only on physical health. There was one time at one wave where they included a psychosomatic measure. It got written up as a chapter in a book. It was never part of their, their program. And this is sort of an aside, but in the 60s, there was a psychiatrist named Robert J. Lifton who went to Hiroshima to interview survivors about the emotional consequences of what they had experienced. And his plan was to go to the ABCC and get people to interview because they were already being seen there. Um, as it turned out, most of the doctors at the ABCC were from Yale, which is exactly where Robert J. Lifton was on his way to, to start as an assistant professor. And they said, absolutely not. So he managed to find a couple of hundred people to interview about their emotional experiences. And he wrote a book called Death in Life. And it's the first unbelievably graphic description of PTSD symptoms in, in this, this group and was a very important book for the DSM-3 uh, codification of PTSD. So, Another example is after Three Mile Island. So yes, there was mental health research, um, but there was basic health surveillance after Three Mile Island because people were, I mean, nobody believed there would be cancers, but people need to document that there wouldn't be cancers. But there was no interest in mental health. I'll come back to that. After Bhopal, there was a psychiatrist who went there who documented and described the mental health issues that were going on, but the actual health programs that were set up to review people's mental health had nothing to do, review people's physical health had nothing to do with mental health. And after Chernobyl, as you know, there have been these big monitoring programs for thyroid cancer in the liquidators and leukemia and thyroid cancer in the children, especially the in utero and the young children. They don't, not only do they not, did they not include mental health and they still don't, although there has been mental health research. Um, but I was on the thyroid advisory group at the National Cancer Institute that advised the, the study that was going on. The reason they asked me to be on it was that they were having trouble keeping their cohort together, and they thought that I was a, quote, social scientist, which I'm not, and that I could help them with that. And when I raised the issue of, since you're preparing for the next round of assessment, why don't you screen for mental health? You don't even have to ask a lot of questions. Just ask a couple of questions but get some sense of it, because it was so obvious that there were huge issues going on with the liquidators, anecdotally. Suicide, alcoholism, depression, and so on. We had heard that from their spouses whom we interviewed. So anyway, it didn't happen. So to put this in an even broader context, none of these programs included mental health, even though there were research findings on the, on, the, on the mental health effects of all of these events. Even though the official consensus of the President's Commission on Three Mile Island and of the Ch Chernobyl Forum report written 20 years after Chernobyl was that mental health was the biggest public health problem. Even though there was 50 years of research on the negative effects of mental health on physical health and disability. So this was not news even when those projects were initiated. There was 30 years of research showing that mental health drives up the cost of medical care because people with mental health problems are the ones who are the heavy utilizers. And the association between mental health and early mortality, that had been shown for decades. So the World Trade Center comes along and it ushered in actually a new era. It was a game changer in terms of thinking about setting up a health surveillance program. 
because it, it did include both physical health and mental health. And when I got to this point of my, as I was thinking about this, I thought, so why did it happen? What went on in 2001 that was different from what had happened before 2001? And I came up with all these theories, but then I got smart and I, inter and I emailed David Prezant and Craig Katz. And I asked them, why was mental health included? The answer is actually rather complicated and I think they need to tell that story. But the fact is that initially it was a public-private partnership. It wasn't that simple. The other answer, which was David's immediate response to my email, was, he said, because we cared. And I think in the case of, of the World Trade Center, unlike the previous situations, as David said, we were at ground zero with the responders. So there wasn't a we-they attitude. It was an us situation. There was a complete understanding of everything that didn't happen before. So what about after the World Trade Center? Well, after the World Trade Center, the biggest event we've had in terms of toxic exposure uh, is the Fukushima accident. Um, in Japan, mental disorders are highly stigmatized. There's no real outpatient care in the sense of th that we have it. Psychiatrists sort of set up these little hospitals and treat people. So there was an initial meeting six months after Fukushima happened in Fukushima City um, on the consequences of the radiation exposure on people's health. That happened to be September 11th, 2010, so that was 2011. So that was the 10th anniversary of the World Trade Center, the six-month anniversary of Fukushima. Um, and I was there as the only mental health speaker, which has always been the case when I go to these radiation health talks. And it was an incredibly emotional meeting. But after the meeting, the Chernobyl Research Group, which included me, um, met with the people designing the health surveillance programs for the residents, not for the workers, but just for the residents, and sort of hammered home the importance of including a mental health component, which the people who were in charge of all of this were in a completely different area of epidemiology. This was just not on their radar, but it, it did get done, and there's a lot of work that's been published. But in terms of the worker follow-up, that's strictly been around physical issues, apart from a study, not a monitoring, but a study um, that was two studies that were done on responders. One focus study on the TEPCO workers at Fukushima and a large-scale study that was done on responders to the whole situation. So I hope in the long run the World Trade Center monitoring and surveillance program really become a model as we go through life and experience future events. So I'm only going to say a few words about the research highlights of the World Trade Center because that's what the whole day has been about. So you've heard about the prevalence and persistence of PTSD, you've heard about the effects of exposure on PTSD, and you've heard about the relationship between PTSD and various kinds of physical health outcomes. So. I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to be very brief. The very first study that was done, that I know of anyway, was done by Sandro Galea um, using random digit dialing. And the people who were living near the World Trade Center had like 20% of them reported enough PTSD symptoms to look like they may have had PTSD. The later studies were done in a lot more sophisticated way, they were done in person, um, they were done with by the registry, by uh, the World Trade Center monitoring program, by researchers like me that managed to get funding to do diagnostic interviews. And through all of those sources, as well as the trajectory analyses that you heard about this morning, it's very clear that there is a subsample of people who really do have persistent uh, mental health issues around PTSD. And the other thing about PTSD that's really important to keep in mind is that it's very impairing. So people who have true PTSD um, are impaired in their functioning. And that's like something that hasn't really been emphasized enough today. So it's, it's not something to think about that's just, ooh, we can put them in this box, they have PTSD. It affects their entire lives. So 
the effects of exposure, there's about a twofold increase depending on the exposure measure people use, depending on the population uh, that was studied. And the comorbidity you heard about all day, so I'm not going to add much to it, except that at Stony Brook, the other issue that we've been looking at more recently, which you may have heard about, is cognitive functioning, and we're also measuring people's physical performance. Okay. Um, so the amount of spillover comorbidity, whatever you want to call it, between PTSD, a lot of these medical conditions you heard about today, and cognitive problems um, are worrisome because a lot of this stuff becomes persistent and chronic. So when you see papers that say, well, I think PTSD is driving the relationship of physical health, and other papers that say, no, I think it's a reciprocal relationship, it's probably all of the above. There have been lots of contributions around mental health. There, there probably are 250 papers on different aspects of mental health. But there's some areas that really have been under-tapped. Uh, one is depression, and I'm not quite sure why. Another is this whole issue of severe headaches and other psychosomatic kinds of problems that people experience. A third is anger and irritability. We're studying men primarily in the responder and firefighter cohorts, and we really haven't dug into that. And the other is, is alcoholism. We also haven't really tapped the full array of biopsychosocial risk factors that we should, um, such as family history of these problems and severe childhood adversities, which, as you know, a lot of research shows is like the most powerful risk factor of all time, affecting everything, physical health, mental health, and comorbidity. And as many people have talked about, we really, apart from a few examples you heard about today, which are exceptions, there haven't been many comparison studies that have used reasonable comparison groups. And since a lot of studies are based on volunteer samples, it's very hard to interpret the findings. Are these rates super high? Are they not, not super high? So assuming we fix all of these problems, which listening to the talks today, I, I, it's very clear that a lot of these things are being addressed, um, we have an incredible opportunity going forward uh, to begin to examine a lot of things, like the multiple aspects of mental health in all the diverse populations that were affected by the World Trade Center. Uh, like the effects of mental health on physical health and aging-related diseases. We know from studies of psychosis that people who have severe mental disorders die 30 years younger than the general population. So, and they get physical diseases that resemble old people 20 years before they should get them. So if you end up with persistent PTSD and depression, what does that mean for aging-related physical disease? And we have a chance to look at and develop new treatments for long-term disorder. There are lots of treatments out there for acute disorder, but that's not what we're talking about anymore. We're talking about long-term disorders. And we also have an opportunity to think about the prevention of secondary consequences of the mental health disorders that have occurred in the first 15 years um, in terms of future psychiatric, future cognitive, and future physical diseases that are going to arise. So, how do you set priorities? Because there are actually a lot of things to do. You set priorities the way the previous speaker just spoke about it. Um, you talk to the people who are affected. So at Stony Brook, we have a big oral history program that Ben Luff started years ago. Um, the registry has done a lot of focus groups. And you have to start thinking flexibly about the batteries that we repeat over and over again in our monitoring program. Should we really be repeating absolutely everything? Are there ways to tighten it so that we don't have to ask all the questions of everybody if they don't have any symptoms, so that we could add other issues that are going to be important as our populations age and develop new diseases? So three brief suggestions. One is around depression. I completely agree with David, so I'm coming back to where we started this morning. I think we need to put more emphasis on depression because Depression is the second leading cause of disability in the world, according to the World Health Organization. 
Depression often comes on the heels of PTSD. Depression is elevated in people with chronic disease. That's been documented forever. Um, depression is often a precursor of cognitive impairment. And depression is treatable. So for all of those reasons, depression should, should get a greater focus. We've identified people in all of our work who have chronic multimorbid conditions, and we know that they're going to be at greatest risk for worsening health and for new health problems. We should focus on these people. We've spent a lot of years characterizing them. We should take advantage of what we've learned and try and help them in the future, as well as do what many of you are doing, which is to think about biobanks, as Roberto talked about with the Italian situation, that doctor was brilliant to, to actually get specimens and hang on to them until they could be analyzed. So, to conclude, the World Trade Center monitoring and health surveillance programs are actually game changers, and you sh should applaud yourselves for what you've been doing over the last 15 years. The first generation studies have primarily been descriptive. They've documented what's gone on, and they've clearly shown that multimorbidity is the norm. And now it's important to extend that work from descriptive to more analytic research to look at aging-related issues and other factors that are going to happen as we uh, grow and as we deal with the health problems that we've had over the last 15 years. And I think it's time to shift our main focus from documentation to intervention. Um, because I think we know who's at greatest risk over the coming decades. Uh, Ron Kessler, who is somebody that I've worked with for many years, wrote a paper in 1993 with Rick Price um, where he said, primary preventions of secondary disorders, that was his phrase, which is actually exactly what we're talking about now, um, will prevent future onsets of psychiatric problems, of medical problems, at least that's the hope, and maybe even aging-related diseases. So I leave you with those thoughts. I'm, I hope you have thoughts of your own, and special thanks to my colleagues at Stony Brook who had to listen to a, a version of this talk. <laughs> so. Um, our next and final speaker, uh, Dr. Crane and myself, would uh, like to take an opportunity to introduce. Dr. Dory Reisman is the Associate Administrator for the 9-11 World Trade Center Health Program administered by NIOSH. Dr. Reisman serves as a CDC subject expert on disaster, mental, and behavioral health policy, research, and program. She has worked to integrate health, safety, and resilience into incident and organizational management strategies for emergency preparedness and response. She initiated efforts to address community and organizational resilience as public health protection strategies and participated in numerous public health missions in response to nat natural disasters and the 2001 anthrax bioterrorism and 9-11 attacks. She is a graduate of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Program, serving as a commissioned officer with the U.S. Public Health Service since 1997. Dr. Reisman graduated from Albert Einstein College of Medicine with subsequent medical specialty training in psychiatry from St. Vincent's Hospital and Medical Center of, of New York, and occupational and environmental medicine at the University of Illinois. Prior to medical training, Dr. Reisman obtained a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Sciences from Cook College, Rutgers University in New Jersey, and a Master's of Arts in Pharmacology and Toxicology from Columbia University in New York. Dr. Crowley and I are certain that we speak for all the program's directors, the staff, and patients when we express our profound gratitude to Dr. Reisman for the leadership, the counsel, and the advocacy that has brought the World Trade Center Health Program to world-class status and to the threshold of the brilliant future that we have glimpsed today. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please lo join Laura and I in welcoming our medical director and associate administrator, Dr. Tori Reisman. Well, now you may be nervous. 
Congratulations for making it this long. I know it's a, it's a long day and it's a, a topic that is difficult to stay present to, so I think that's really important. But one of the things I think has been probably the, the biggest thing that I've taken out of today, and that's the fact that so many of the people that have gotten up in front of you have actually been both the responder and the survivor, the researcher, the clinician, and the human being around this event. And many of the people who came, I think practically everybody has been a New Yorker, as I have been myself. So for most of us who work in the field, it's personal and it's meaningful. And the meaning is not just for our own lives, it's for the lives of the future and the fact that we have to learn something here in order to have made it worthwhile to have lived through the experience. So I figured the first thing for me to show you was something you can't see. <laughs> I think it's important to show you that there's a lot of thinking that goes behind this program. It's not just the federal government thinking, but this was an attempt to evolve a lot of individual thoughts from many of you in the audience into one logic model to actually run a program. For those of you who might not be familiar with logic models, it starts really on this yellow or your left side and flows over towards the right, but it's so circular because it keeps going back and around and around and around. We could spend hours talking about the interactions of this model. But what it meant was all the people that talked to you earlier today are in that yellow box on the left. They're the, all the inputs all the members of our healthcare program, all the members or registrants of the registry who have contributed their information for the purpose of science, all the people in this audience who have been involved in advocacy for the efforts, especially for the survivors whose stories still really aren't told. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to live with this and not have their information out front in ways in which the advocacy can really do it justice. The activities of all of this go into funding announcements for research, great scientific minds come together and try and propose their solutions to what kinds of information they could generate to help us in the, in the field. And then we try and take their information and we try and make sense of it in terms of how we practice our our clinical world, how we practice in our public health world. And then we try and really distill messages from that back out to the people who were directly affected, not just in the clinical care they receive, but in the messages that we put out from the program, we put out through the press, we put out through all kinds of you know, public venues. And even still, people don't realize that this program's even here. Uh, that there's help available, uh, that there have been problems, that there are still problems. It's just really mind-boggling. Some of the outputs from people today, you've heard about the fact that they've been able to link the exposures from 9-11 to health effects. Because of their pioneering scientific work, we had this program. They did the research, and I can use that word today, but you couldn't use that research word back in 2001. That was just taboo then. So they had to do it somewhat clandestinely to provide the numbers to convince those that had the ability to pass legislation to make funding available. And it's been a fight all the way ever since. The short story of all of this is there has been improved recognition of the health outcomes. There has been expertise in care and excellent clinicians who have been both the scientific pioneers as well as the caretakers. They've been the ones to listen to people's stories throughout the years and deal with the patients in their waiting rooms. They've been the ones out front in Congress trying to get the funds to continue. They've been the ones with the media trying to keep the, the memories and the issues alive. And with this still even more, they're trying to turn this over into new curriculum for our next crop of doctors and nurses and all kinds of allied health professionals that help us in the field. So how do we stay relevant? How do we stay relevant today when everything competes for money, everything competes for attention? 
The relevancy really here, aside from the devastating attacks, is the chronicity of impact. I think you've heard from a number of researchers today that there was a big, acute, overwhelming exposure, and then for others, there was this lower level chronic exposure. But either way, you had acute health outcomes that didn't go away. They, you know, they settled down into this chronic way of interfering with somebody's life. They changed the direction and the trajectory, if you will, of what their life could have become. Some of these stories we don't yet really understand or know, and that probably deals more with the younger generation. So I'm going to move beyond this slide and talk about many things you heard today had to do with advocacy. It's the mixing of a melting pot of scientists, clinicians, public health people, administrators of programs in federal and city and other types of dollars from the other programs that were available when the disaster was closer, the philanthropic sources. It's the research community that takes interest in the opportunities to advance our scientific knowledge. And in disaster, unfortunately, it's always leapfrogging. You wait for the next disaster to make the next step. And I think Dr. Bromet really said it quite well. Mental health has come a long way, and it came a long way at the heels of so many. So that when I was working at CDC and we actually had the tsunamis that happened in, I think it was 2004 or five in the Indian Ocean, the first thought on Dr. Gerberding's mind at that point, who was the head of CDC, was what about our responders' safety and health? Maybe we ought to think about that as we're sending people out to things they've never been exposed to. Well, that would never have happened without the intervening impacts of what happened here. So we have federal advisory committees. We have steering committees, which is an interesting amalgam of not being a federal advisory committee, yet providing input to the government. Um, we have grantee conferences among those who were funded for research to share their preliminary findings as they pop up and way before things get into publications for the general community to consume. We have weekly calls, believe it or not, after 15 years. We have weekly calls with the clinical centers where we talk about everything from the latest complaint to larger program issues of how do we approach some of these difficult diagnoses? How do we deal with the uh, severity and acuity issues when somebody's coming in and out of, uh, say, a hospital and has to go into some other kind of step-down unit, way beyond the, the original reach of the clinical centers of excellence? We've created medical homes, even though they can't be called that by virtue of the fact that they can't do general primary care. So we take this microcosm of all of American health care and we bottle it into these clinics who are all very different in the way that they run inside their institutional umbrellas with all the complexities that they have to deal with inside those umbrellas. And we say do more and more and more. So the excellence used to be what you knew about environmental and occupational health and how you link those exposures. It's still there. But really, 15 years later, the excellence is going to come from how do you deal with the person? How do you deal with a person with complex illness, with multiple illnesses, with multiple medication regimens, with perhaps other changes that might be going on cognitively that can interfere even with adherence strategies that are so important for any kind of therapeutic outcome? How do we deal with the person? Our healthcare system doesn't really address the person. It's not really patient-centric. So we've got some big challenges ahead of us. I'm going to breeze through the rest of these slides just to make sure I've touched on at least the bigger picture of what our research agenda is now looking like. It started with the kinds of conditions that we already had some idea about. We already knew at the point where we were authorized as a federal health care entitlement program in 2011 through the Zadroga Act. We knew we had these diseases to worry about already. They were written into the law. What we didn't know at the time was about whether cancers were going to be it. You heard from Dr. Howard earlier this morning. Yes, we did move cancer into this realm. Really, before all the scientific robustness could truly make an unquestionable case, you have to do things in public policy to weigh the odds, and we did. 
I'd say autoimmune disorders, some cardiovascular disorders, they're kind of in that next tier of, hmm, we see something, we see a signal, we don't, we're not sure what to do with it. Autoimmune is hugely expensive and very multi-organ. Cardiovascular is hugely common and very expensive. So what do you do with that? This is public money. How do we protect the public trust? This just gives you a quick snapshot view of funding for extramural research, not counting the registry work that has been so productive. This is just the extramural program outside of that. Respiratory disease has taken the lead along with mental health then pediatric projects and some cancer projects. But what we've seen from all of this is that there has been a need for more collaboration across different entities. If we have a firefighter cohort and a general responder cohort and what we call the survivor cohort, if you're looking at cancer, which is supposed to be a rare outcome, it's very hard to look at those individually. You really have to combine them. And if you combine them after you create the questionnaires and the ways in which you assess your information, you're behind the eight ball because you haven't had the same questions asked in the same way. Well, that's where we were. And a lot of effort's been done to try and bridge those gaps and to try and learn more from those situations. We recently expanded the agenda once we knew we were renewed for ongoing funding now through 2090. And we're really asking questions about healthcare service delivery. How do we get the value in this? Not just the fee for service in this, but you know, chronic disease, if you look at cancer care models that are happening right now, the value is around case navigation, care management, care coordination. Um, these are the intangibles that aren't fee-for-service particulars. They're the confused person who's looking for help and they need to be navigated through a system. They don't understand how to navigate the program that's providing them benefits. And they're confused on top of that because the treatment affects their cognitive function. So there's all kinds of issues that we really need to address. The lessons for recovery, we've heard a, a few things about that today, but there's so much work there to be done. You know, work ability. The United States is different than the rest of the world. We work much more than everybody seems to work. I'm not sure why, but we do. So the work ability then becomes incredibly important. Are you no longer able? Have we really looked at that? Do we understand what happened occupationally from the people who were affected in 9-11 grappling with chronic and complex illness? Where did they go? Did they just fall out of the workforce? Did they get underemployed? What happened? These are things that we should really kind of make some dent in. I think the comparison area, the comparison groups, that's the plague of disaster research. We don't have big populations that we study in general. They're very expensive to study. But we have to identify something that allows us to make sense of those who are affected. You can never understand who those affected unless you look at them against somebody just like them but not exposed to the problem. You just can't tease it apart scientifically. And of course, unfortunately, we are all aging. I tried to escape it. Some of you may have tried. You can't. And it just interferes with everything that we're doing. I really think that there are issues around perhaps some prematurity and things that are happening for some of our folks, but we need the science to make the case. We need people outside of our group here to reflect on some of the work they're doing in other populations to understand it better. And then finally, we have here the whole trajectory, the lifelong story for the children. Children whose illnesses, like let's just take respiratory, who had too many absences in school, who then were not given the opportunity to go to the better schools in order to get the better next leg of their education. That changed their life trajectory possibilities. So what does that mean? How do we ever measure that? How do we ever capture that? You're not going to find the same entities within health, mental health, education, the social support, Department of the Environment, these are all distinct departments in most cities and most federal governments, and the crosstalk there is very, very difficult. So how do you ever unify the approach? 
I wanted to give a plug for the registry, even though Dr. Brackbill did a wonderful job of representing that which he was a founding member to help create. Um, Bob, you've done an incredible job, and you don't get enough. <laughs> So this registry, I mean, I wish we had more information gathered by them. I wish we had a broader population that they could have, you know, been responsible for managing the data for. Those public data sets are up there waiting for those who are interested. I wish we could have done that more in general. It's just so hard to do those kinds of things. So the very end of this talk, I also want to give some acknowledgement. I don't know if he's still here, but Dr. Max Lum at NIOSH, who's been an innovator for us, he's been the one who reminded us about uh, things that are happening in the younger generation with social media. He was the one who actually forced NIOSH to get out of the arcane stacks where you search things by hand and move into the, the current century. With that, he helped get the pieces together to redesign our, our website, our research gateway, to try and translate the information we're learning to products that people can truly consume. And we're trying to socialize our research. That's both a blessing and probably a curse for some of you as researchers because you're out of your element. You know, once you reach a certain age, it's taken off without you. <laughs> That's just a fact. So this is our research gateway. Um, I know it's, again, tiny print, but that means you have to go look at it so you can really get a good sense of it. It's highly interactive. It's asking for feedback. Um, we're looking to show impacts of what the researchers were attempting to do. We've put out some uh, YouTube uh, video clips from our research conferences where the individual researcher gives a little blurb about what they think was the most important thing they found in English, in plain English, which is not easy for researchers. So this slide to me embodies all of it. You got all these sources of social media and you have most of us down on that lower corner that says I was really good at all this before they changed the rules. And now it's all different. As soon as something's said, it's internet searchable. So accountability for words, very different, even images and anything else you might try. The last thing I'll mention is that we attempted to try and take some of the information from the very people who spoke with you today and move it into a wonderful disseminator, which was Medscape. They reached clinicians very, very well, physicians, nurses, um, perhaps some other allied health professions. and. These four particular topics, and I think there's a fifth one now with cancer out there, really went out quickly. And you can see the uptake down below, even though it's a little blurred on this slide, but it was showing a geographic uptake of people who decided to take the CME courses. So we are trying to actually take this into CDC to continue offering the CME, because Medscape only does that for a certain period of time. But we think it's important. This is a way to reach all the, the folks outside of the immediate cities that were affected. These are the websites for those of you who don't know them already. Um, the logic model is there, the proceedings from our research uh, grantee meetings, our current uh, announcement, which is a circular announcement every, I think, quarterly or semi-annually, whatever that is where proposals are looked at and evaluated through a, uh, a peer-reviewed panel for technical merit. And then the website, the projects that have been funded, the results of those projects, the publications, they're all listed there, easy to reach. And I think that draws it to conclusion. I do want to thank you. Um, you have to carry the story. You have to make sure that the next generation gets it. You know, they, you'll find that young ones in school now, 9-11, what was that about? I, I, I didn't know anybody who did that or was involved in that. It's not that far in the future that you'll start to hear that. So the question is, how do we really wrap this into something that transcends and makes a difference? So thank you for your attention. So... Uh...
that'll close our program. Uh, we want to thank you so very much for hanging in and, and first of all, in the, attending with us all the way. Um, you could see that uh, on the Medscape diagram, we're trending very well in Georgia. We might take Florida, too. Um, so uh, I think we've had a great day here. And uh, please, as Dr. Reisman said, there is this issue, right? We, we're New Yorkers. Um, we're sort of used to this idea. Uh, we know what 9-11 is, and we sort of expect others to do so. And if we don't get the word out, they won't know. So we all have to think about that going forward. So thanks a lot. See you next time.